Good morning, YouTube. It is Monday morning. Some of you guys throughout the offseason might have got used to me doing the behind the business of fantasy football interviews every Monday. And those have since stopped because of the NFL drafts were strictly focused on preparing y'all for your fantasy football season. However, I was invited onto a friend of mine's show, The Notorious Fantasy, Nicholas, a fellow New Jersey native, and I can't turn that down ever. And he wanted to interview me, such as I had been interviewing other people about the business of fantasy football. So behind the scenes, the lifestyle, the whole YouTube thing, you know, business and, and that kind of shit. So we filmed this a few days ago. I figured I would throw it up on my channel as well. Hopefully you guys will get some value from it. You will uh, get to know me a little bit more as a person, what we got going on here at BDGE, the behind the scenes. I thought it was a really fun interview. So uh, if you enjoyed it, make sure you hit the thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to Nick's channel. His stuff will be linked down below. And I always like putting this stuff on uh, on Monday mornings because hopefully it gets a, a good start to your week going. So again, if you watch, I, I really hope you guys enjoy this shit. This is a real, you know, behind the layers, peel back look at, at what we got going on here and who I am as a person. So I love y'all and enjoy. Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick or The Notorious Fantasy, and today I am joined with Nicholas Ercolano of BDGE, obviously the big man over there, the king of YouTube. So today we are going to be doing an interview series where I just talk to Nick, I just ask him a bunch of questions, and he's going to answer them. They're not really based upon fantasy football questions. So should you draft Cam Akers or Clyde Edwards-Hilaire? Obviously it's CEH, but who gives a fuck right now? So we're just going to be talking about the bigger type of things here that go into BDGE. So welcome in, Nick. Uh, if you have anything to plug, obviously they know who you are, so you can pl plug yourself anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to the interview. I'm sorry this took so long to kind of get situated. You know, it's crazy, crazy times. But uh, anytime, you know, we can get on the airwaves and, and talk about things that are not sports or fantasy related, uh, you can count me in. And uh, usually I'm doing the interviews for these kind of things. So it's nice to kind of sit back and relax and not have to worry about, you know, segueing through the interview and like paying attention to what's on the show sheet next and whatever. So I'm in, a, I'm in a good mindset. I think uh, we got two great guys with two great names, and I think we're going to have a, a great show today. So thanks for having me, Nick. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, for sure. Since I'll be doing the segueing, Scott, you can hit the intro now. So let's get right into it. Backstory. <laughs> on you so the, the this beginning part is just mainly just backstory on you before you even got into fantasy football so what was the day in the life of yourself before you became a fantasy analyst i was working at a marketing agency in new york before i finally left and started doing content full time so a day in the life would be me waking up early you know, trying to catch the the train to, to New York. It was it was in Manhattan at the time. I would typically pull up to the train at like 7.53 when I knew damn well it was departing at 7.52. So I would, it was nice because I wouldn't have to get any exercise in for the rest of the day because I would typically just sprint to the train as soon as I parked my car. Uh, I'd ride into New York and I'd work the typical nine to six or seven, whatever the day entailed. Um, so I was working at an agency and then you take the commute right back home. So you know, very, very typical 22, 23, 24 year old entry level um, business position. And um, yeah, that was that was kind of the, the day in the life for me. Yeah, Nothing I think crazy. they should get you. I think they should get you on player profiler so we can figure out your burst score if you're running that fast. So <laughs> it would be obviously. Fucking yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so obviously you chose the name BDGE. So why did you choose that? What made you choose that? Uh, BDGE for any of you guys out there uh, that don't know, it stands for big dogs got to eat. And this is, uh, I know it's kind of like a ridiculous name. I think when people hear it at first, they're probably like, what a, what a douchey fucking name. And I've, I've had comments like that before, and, and that's totally fine. Uh, it goes back to, it actually goes back to my, my senior year in college. We have um, kind of like a long story, but we have a senior week, right? If, I don't know if, if any of you guys have like graduated college, the last week of college before graduation is like this crazy week. At least it was at, at Maris where I graduated from, and you have um, – you have all these days planned out. It's like a, you know, a beer Olympics, a, um, a bar crawl, a house party crawl, whatever. And there was a beer pong tournament and there was like 84 teams in it, right? It was my entire class and each team had like a team of, you know, six people or whatever. And we had this, this giant uh, beer Olympics and my team entered and we ended up, uh, we ended up winning the entire thing. I'll fast forward to the end of it. And in like the semifinals, like with the last game of the entire thing was like a, 
a boat race where, you know, you just line up your six players on your team and everyone just fucking chugs the beer and whoever finishes first would take the cake of the, of the game, right? And move on to the next round. And that was like the final game. And, uh, and I was the anchor on the team because for some reason I had like a really weird ability to chug the, like that would be fucking elite on player profiler if they had that stat on there. So we'd get to the anchor of it. And, uh, and for some reason, I don't know why, but like, we 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 finished the semifinal game, I think. And once I slammed my beer down, I yelled out like, "Big dogs got to eat!" Right? Mm. And that became like our credo for the for the remainder of the tournament. We had like three more matchups after that, I think. And after we'd chug, we'd slam it down and be like, "Big dogs got to eat!" And we were yelling it just like a bunch of douchey college kids or whatever. And uh, and that became like a saying that me and my friends would say for a little while after that, right? And it became kind of a part of my life. And then. Uh, when I wanted to start up the brand, I was like, what's a, what's a name that like, you know, isn't very typical, but it also like relates to me and my lifestyle and, and the brand that I want to port- portray to people. And I was like, oh, big dog's got to eat. Fantasy football is pretty good. Um, but realistically, what it means to me is is that it's like the intertwining of a lifestyle brand, but also for people like big dogs, in a sense, are, are people that are willing to get outside of the the typical norm of the day-to-day stuff right and are willing to put their creativity out there and they're willing to be judged by the world Um, because I think that's you know at the end of the day that's how we make progress in things right you have to push the boundaries and push the edges a little bit otherwise we'd all stay stagnant and we'd all be in the same place so big dogs are the people that are willing to push the boundaries a little bit and gotta eat is really like gonna eat right like these people who the people that are willing to do that shit are the ones that are going to innovate and they're the, they're going to be the ones that push the world forward a little bit at a time so that's really the, the the name behind it comes from you know my college senior week but what it means uh i, I would hope it would be a little bit more depth to the, to the audience out there okay that makes a lot of sense so obviously your youtube channel name is your real name so why did you choose that over maybe bdg or big dogs gotta eat uh, well, I, I would say I chose it in like when I first, first started it in the beginning, it was just like, you know, I just type my name in whatever. And that's what it was. And I kept it at that, but I've kept it at Nick or Colano because I don't think like, I, I believe it or not for the audience out there, I don't like, um, <laughs> and also just a, a, a keynote in there. I, I also thought he was drinking a beer. We're filming this at, <laughs> at like 10 AM right now. And I was like total fucking power move for drinking a Bud Light right now. It is is not a Bud Light, apparently. It's a I'm Pepsi. Not sure I'm not I'm old enough to do that yet, you know. We don't yeah, drink yeah, underage yeah. here, you know. I'm sure all the kids that are 20 years old aren't drinking beers on the weekends anyway. No, I never do that, no. Um, so, what was I talking Oh, my, <laughs> the channel name. Yeah, so, like, Nick Urclano, it, it's just, like, believe it or not, I don't, I don't love – like, fantasy football is one part of, of what I do, right? It's, like, the content that I provide – but it's not who I am, you know, and I don't want like YouTube will always be my main marketing platform for me as a person, no matter what I want to do or what type of content I want to put out there. So I don't want to box myself in and, you know, make my channel name BDGE fantasy football. Cause what happens when I want to start pivot in five years, I might just strictly do like marketing and business content. And then that's uh-huh. fucking a weird overlap and I can't do that. But if I'm just Nick Urcolano, I don't put myself in this, you know, this, this mental box or this non-physical box where it's like, you can't really pivot off of that. So I was just like, you know, that it's just who I am. I don't want to put myself in a position where if I do want to pivot, you know, it comes with a lot of backlash or it doesn't really make sense business-wise. So uh, Nick Urcolano, it's just, it, that's just who I am. And the channel that I provide, yes, it has a lot of like differing fucking types of content. And I know a lot of people talk about like best practice on YouTube. It's like, yes, you should stick to this and stick to this topic. And I'm just like, I don't really give a fuck. Like you, you come yeah. to Nick Urcolano's channel, you're going to get Nick Urcolano. I don't, I don't even know what that's going to be, but that's what you're going to get. So I've always stuck with it and that will remain to be the, the case going forward. No, oh, Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. I just chose my name because I just was sitting there and I was like, you know what? I saw McGregor. I was watching some McGregor highlights and I was like, you know what? Notorious fantasy. That's me. So that's what I did. Okay. Yeah. I I just like, there's, there's so many names in, in our space where it's just like, I don't know, like how many fucking rotos could you possibly have? You know what I mean? Like there's roto this and roto that and fucking X, Y, and Z. And I'm just like, dude, they're all this fucking same to me. Roto, you know, I don't want to like throw fucking names out there, but (laughs) I I don't know. You can't differentiate anyone from, from those things. I'm just like, I don't want to be in that fucking mess, that swarm of, of people who are going to eventually you know, die out because they're not differentiating themselves. 
Yeah, there's there's a billion guys on Twitter with something something FF, and they have like they follow a thousand people, they have a thousand followers, and that's all they are. So yeah, it's like that's what fantasy Twitter kind of is nowadays. And not that not that they're not you know doing great work. A lot of the guys I respect the hustle and I, I respect the work yeah. that they put in. It's just like that's just not the way I I would go about it myself. Yeah, no, I get that. I, I agree. I don't follow a thousand people just to get a thousand followers. You know, shade mm-hmm. at those guys, but. Obviously, your company, you have uh, Snacks and Animal there. So how did you meet both of those guys? I interviewed both of them. I got their story, but maybe yours is slightly different. You think they were lying to you? And we, have a, we actually have, have, a, we have a different backstory. <laughs> Who knows? I, I mean, yeah, the way those fucking two act, they could be fucking robots that I order, to be honest with you. Uh, now, so we all went to high school together. Um, Snacks was the grade below me. Animal was two grades above me. He actually graduated with my sister. Um, me and Snacks have been friends since we were younger. I would say like we became close friends in high school. Uh, we definitely started hanging out more and like partying together, maybe like sophomore or junior year and definitely my senior year. We were we got really, really tight. Um, so we had been in a fantasy league together, the E-Town Get Down League, which is basically what the Fade the Public podcast kind of follows. You know, that's, that's the league that it kind of uh, centers around. And uh, me and Nick had been friends for, for a long time outside of fantasy. So we had known each other forever. And then Animal we had an open spot in the league. I've always been like friendly with animal, but I definitely wasn't like friends with him. I, I we went to a, a small high school. So it's like, you kind of know everybody, you know, I graduated with like fucking, I think 90 kids. And that was like considered a big class <laughs> in our town. And I could tell you like every person's name along with probably like fucking three fun facts about each person I graduated with. Cause we did school from pre-K through 12th grade together. Um, so I knew who animal was obviously. And uh, when the, person whoever it was left our league animal i think had actually joined to be a co-owner the year before he took on a a team by himself Uh um so we got close through fantasy football when he uh eventually made his way into the e-town get down league oh okay that makes a lot of sense so obviously now we're going to pivot into more talking about your content so at the beginning, you pretty much emphasized an importance in using your business background to gain success. So at the beginning of your career, you were kind of with Fantasy Jocks. So how did that experience with Fantasy Jocks help you to get to where you're at now? And how did you also begin to start talking to Fantasy Jocks? Um, I think when I started, I think I started very much like a lot of people in the industry start now. Uh, I, originally, I started blogging and uh, I wasn't really sure like, you know, how to get my name out there. So I reached out to fantasy jocks um, to see if they wanted me to write some blog posts because I thought it was a cool opportunity. You know, you, I, I think I, I reached out to a bunch of different sites like Bleacher Report and all these like big name sites that all like den- <laughs> denied me right away. But <laughs> fantasy jocks was, was, was uh, a much better fit for me in the sense that their product, like the blogs that I could put out on their website were way more, um, like lifestyle and commissioner focus, you know, like it was about like how to throw the best draft day party. And I'm like, Oh, this is right up my alley. Like, I don't care about writing about like fucking Julio Jones's yards per out run, but let me talk about how to fucking make a margarita at your draft day. You know what I mean? And, I, and they were cool as hell. So I linked up with them and I reached out and I think I probably wrote a sample for them or something. This was back uh, a long time ago. I was probably like 20 or 21 years old at the time. I think, um, and I started writing blog posts for them and, uh, and it went well. And from there, you know, I started doing my own thing. I started writing for a, a couple of different fantasy websites. And it, you kind of just like need that experience when you're starting off because you just have no idea what the fuck you're doing. You don't really know how to get your name out there. So you try things, you realize that they don't work. And then you're like, okay, I don't want to write for them anymore. I don't want to write whatever. Um, so fantasy jocks was, yeah, they were, they were just a good fit for me personally. And maybe it was a subconscious thing. I didn't even really think about it that way, that it was more of like a lifestyle kind of blogging thing that I was able to do with them, but it was just a perfect, uh, a perfect fit. And, uh, and then I had worked with them doing their marketing stuff for, for a while as well, because once I left my actual marketing job, I put out a vlog, I think it was like really the first vlog I ever put out saying that, you know, I'm going to kind of start my own business. And at the time, it wasn't like I want to start a fantasy business. It was more like, (laughs) I'm leaving my job to freelance, right? And my passion is behind content, but I need to make money somehow. So I'm going to take the skills that I learned at this marketing job and apply them to the real world so that I can have income while I have now more flexibility and, and versatility to, you know, put my time towards the fantasy stuff. So it was doing the marketing stuff on the side. Um, and I put out in the vlog, like, you know, I'm going to start doing Facebook and Instagram marketing for 
um, social me- or uh, social media marketing, whatever for these businesses. And mm. the CEO of, of fantasy jocks, who is the one I had been in contact with for the, you know, the last three or four years prior to that video, uh, reached out to me. He's like, Hey, I like, you know, I, uh, I saw your vlog. I thought it was like really good. And we're actually looking for someone to take over that part of the business. Like, I'll give you a shot on that. And I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. So they were my first client in the marketing world. And uh, the campaigns went really, really well. And we, we had worked together for a couple of years after that for the marketing stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're still in contact today. I don't, I don't do their marketing, obviously, for them anymore. And I don't do their blog posts or whatever. But, uh, but I love the guys over at Fantasy Jocks. And we just, it kind of happened to be like the best of both worlds at my first marketing client. My first marketing client could have been like a fucking plumber, you know, or like a real estate <laughs> agent or something like that. It just so happened to be someone in the space. Uh, so I got really lucky and uh, it was, you know, it went really well. And, and that's kind of the backstory between where I started blogging and, and fantasy jocks and that whole history. Okay. So is that really the point that you would consider like the defining moment of when you wanted to change to become, go from marketing to fantasy? Or was there a different moment when you really decided, you know what, fuck it. Let me just become a fantasy analyst and say, fuck you marketing. I would say that didn't come until like a little bit before I moved into Brooklyn last year. So I'm in Manhattan now. I lived in Brooklyn uh, from April till the previous April. And that was more of like a lifestyle change I needed to make. Yeah. And I realized that I had been focusing so much on fantasy content and a lot less on marketing. I think at that point, maybe Fantasy Jocks and like one other company was like my, my marketing clients. And, uh, and I was like, I need to get, I need to get out of, of my mom's house and I need to like be more creative, you know, and I, I can't do that stuck here anymore. So I think as soon as I got that in my head that I was like, I'm moving out and I'm going to go move to Brooklyn or whatever. That's when I was like, okay, this is it. Like, this is when I take that full <laughs> step forward to become full time on, on fantasy. So I had always worked like I was full time on fantasy. But in terms of like, okay, I'm going to fucking put my foot down and make enough money to support myself doing full time fantasy. That wasn't really until I started doing um, until like a little bit before I moved into into Brooklyn last year. Okay, so obviously you just talked about it before. You you took YouTube over like writing, even though you started writing at the beginning. So, what would that have been easier to do, and why did you choose YouTube over it if it could have been an easier thing? Because at the time it seemed like not too many people were doing YouTube. It was more like blogs or podcasting. Yeah, I just um, I don't like I don't really like writing. I don't like writing for the sake of like giving value to people via writing. I'll do the the blog posts only because they help me digest the information you know um when i when i write these blogs they're just notes for my videos so when i started off i was like dude i hate writing i'm not good at writing like i don't care for writing but when i get on camera and i start recording video i feel like i'm i'm the i don't want to say the best version of myself because i usually sound like a fucking moron but i'm I'm (laughs) definitely like the truest version of myself you know and i don't want to portray anything other than that and i feel like when you're reading fantasy articles they all kind of come off the same it's all like the same stats and stuff and it's very very difficult to differentiate your personality when you're doing it through a blog post unless you're an incredible incredible writer and I would say 99.5 percent of the people in our industry do good work in their articles but they're not incredible writers by any means and that shit will just fall to the wayside right you can't really build a brand that way unless you know people who who want to build up a brand through blogging even five or six years ago when it was less saturated are hoping that they they get an opportunity with a big site, right? Like they get the, the Roto World spot or now like the fantasy footballers or something. They put out an article and they're hoping that the other people with a, with a shit ton of clout at these companies and these brands like retweet their stuff. And that's how they're going to get the following. But like that's – I don't think that's a good way about, you know, going about uh, building your brand because people aren't going to remember you from, from the article in itself. And I was always just way, 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 way more comfortable on camera doing things via video – uh, a lot of the shit that I think goes into video is like such a powerful, um, it, it's just such a, it, it's such a powerful way of building your audience and they become so loyal to you. Not even like loyal, like you probably say a bunch of dumb shit and they're just like, you're wrong about this, but they'll still love you because they feel like they know you as a person. You know what I mean? Like you have friends who do dumb shit all the time, but you still love them because they're your friends. Like that's the way, that's the kind of relationship that you build with your audience via video that you can't do that via blogging and shit. So it was just a, a mixture of me being really comfortable on camera, feeling that I presented the most truest, truest version of myself and got my point across the way I wanted to get my point across, you know? 
Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I tried to start writing, and I was like, you know what? Let me read a bunch of Barstool posts and see how El Prez does it, try to write just like him, and then I end mm-hmm. up sounding like a fucking idiot. So I was like, yeah, you know what? It's just, this is easier. It's, it's just like writing is, is you end up forming – you end up trying to be somebody else in your writing. You know what I mean? Like you take over a different personality just so you can come across differently, but it ends up being different than like who you are. It's very, it's very difficult to come across as like a very good writer. And I'm just like that's – the way I write is exactly how I, how I talk. So – like if you're reading something of me and you're like, wow, this is really well written. I'm like, okay, well, it probably wasn't me then. Or it probably was like me spending way more extra time to make it sound nice. But I don't, I don't know. I just don't want to come across that way at all, really. Yeah, I mean, that thing you wrote on New Year's Eve was like a goddamn masterpiece. So it seems like you're not that bad at writing. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, I, don't, I don't really know where that came from, to be honest with you. I kind of just like sat down one day and I was just like, I'm going to fucking get in the zone and write this. I wrote that, I think, in, in one entire sitting. And uh I don't know. That was, I, I will, I will give myself a little bit of a pat on the back. I thought that was, that was well written when I went back and, and read it again. Um, but typically I don't write that way. And I think that was maybe, maybe that was a little bit of, uh, of luck, but it, that was just like my true authentic self. I've had, a, I had a lot of people I actually had someone tell me like a few days ago that they read it and it drove them crazy that I kept switching between like you, like Y O U and the letter U during it. I was like, I, honestly, I didn't even fucking realize I was doing that. So I apologize. But yeah, I mean, that came out well, only probably because the points within the article were, um, were really like authentic and really transparent in a sense, you know, I don't think like the grammar, if you went back and read, I'm sure I have like tons of run on sentences and, and shit like that, that doesn't uh, bode well in the writing community. But um, well, thank you for, uh, for the, the little, the little positive plug there, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what came over me for that, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I mean, I tried to write and I was writing the wrong there and stuff. I still do that in my papers for school. Like, I think my third grade English teacher just failed me or something because I have no idea which there to use <laughs> at all. So, you obviously, still don't know? no, I still don't know. Like, it just auto corrects. I use that Grammarly shit. How do you so. not know? Like, I, I understand, like, some things are difficult to get, but I always felt like the whole there thing was super fucking well, simple. Well, I know some of them, like, that they are, like, that's the one. And then there's there you, there, go. you and just then narrowed there's... out one of the three. And the yeah, I know. And then the other two, two, you know, they're up in the air. So. That's unbelievable. I'm going to have to go to some fucking English class after this. So yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> obviously you got into this early. So how did you try to ensure your success early since you've gotten so early, obviously? Um, early on YouTube. On, on YouTube. Um, I don't, I don't think I looked at it that way. I don't, I don't think there was any like ensuring success. I think it, I think it goes back to like working really fucking hard. I, I really think at the core of it, like that's what it's about. Like even you have, are, are starting to build like a, a decent sized audience. Right. And like, what do you credit that with? Just a shitload of fucking work. Right. Yeah. No, it's literally just going to bed late after editing, just fucking working every day, putting out a it's bunch just of videos. getting up, doing the research, writing the post, doing the video, video editing. Right. So it wasn't like if there was no secret to it, there was no like, okay, I'm going to do this to ensure my success. It was just like, I'm going to work my fucking ass off for three years with doing nothing but trying to provide value to these people. Right. And that was it. And I think that's how, that's how, you know, we've built the foundation of everything and to ensure success. Um, I mean, I look at things obviously way different now because we've kind of already been accepted by the market, you know? So it feels like yeah. as long as we keep working hard and providing good content, like we're, we can experiment now a lot, you know, because we have a little bit of, of leverage within the market, but Back then, yeah, there was no, there was nothing like tricky to it. It was, it was straight up just like working really fucking hard for a really long time and, and doing it consistently. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so at the beginning, when I started making videos, I kind of just did it by myself. And then eventually, at kind of near the end of the year, I brought in other people. So I brought in uh, Noah was the first person I brought on. And then I brought on Tyler, Lucas, all those guys, Danny mm-hmm. uh, and Bush. So at the beginning, I started off just doing it by myself. So what made you want to, from the beginning, really do it with uh, the other guys? So Snacks and George are in your first video, at least the first video that's on your channel. I'm not sure if that's the, your first ever video, but why did you choose to become more of a collaborative kind of group instead of just yourself from the beginning, even though a lot of your content is by yourself? Um, it's a good question. I never wanted to do it with other people. Oh. I, uh, I didn't want to do it collaboratively at all. I... When I started, I think I was way too nervous to do it by myself. I think I was like really nervous about like just getting judged by other people. When I started blogging, 
even when like the blog started gaining a little bit of traction, I don't think I ever told anybody I was doing it. I think I did it for an entire summer without telling like my family, my friends or anyone, because I was just like really nervous about, um, you know, just putting myself out there and, and uh, getting judged by, by people that I know and people that I don't know or whatever. Um, and I think maybe that's like something that drives me to this day about trying to help people open up and, and feel okay to do things like that. Right. Going back to the big dogs got to eat. Like it's for people that will uh, put themselves out there and do that. And I think there's a lot of, I see a lot of myself in, in kids that I wish would, would, would do that. Right. Like, I don't want you to be stuck thinking that it's, it, it's scary. It is scary, obviously, but I don't want you to be stuck at that, at that uh, bump in the road thinking that you can't do it because you're going to be judged by other people. So when I started off, I think the, the reason behind wanting to do it with George and snacks was because I was, I was kind of nervous to do it by myself, but if I could pull in other people that were my friends, then it would be like less, you know, less scrutiny on you and people would be like, Oh, you know, it's like them three friends just kind of fucking around. So realistically doing it by myself was always the mode. I'm, I'm way better when I'm by myself, right? Like I just get in my zone and I start doing video and like that, that's, that's me at my peak. I think in terms of like collaborating down the road, like I did individual videos for like two and a half or three years, I think like snacks and George yeah. were in like two of my early videos. But I think after that, it was me for like two or three years by myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I started opening up because I started looking at things from, um, I think the collaborative stuff was more of a business, uh, move to be honest. Uh, I think that like, I, I think long term, and I think like fade the public, I think the idea behind it was like following our league in depth, right? And almost turning that into a reality show of sorts. And we're so far away from where I thought it would be going. We haven't, and that's not a bad thing. It's just like, we have a lot of work to do to, to become the show that I think we can become. And I think a lot of that comes to us being together physically, because we'll be able to, to film a lot more of the behind the scenes shit. So the idea behind the collaboration there was, more of a branding play to be like a really funny show that we just follow the league with. And, um, and that was a collaboration with snacks and animal and then collaborating now with like Noah and Mike that again was like business. Well, for one, Noah had been blogging for me. He was like the only person that was blogging on my website besides myself for like two or three years. He worked extremely fucking hard doing like two or three long form pieces a week. And I know he was working fucking hard because I know how long those types of pieces take to take to make, you know? So I know from experience that he was working hard, and I was just like, again, it goes back to, I don't think you could really build a brand from just blogging. So I was like, yeah, I want to put you on a little bit. Why don't you come on to the videos with me? Because I think that would, um, that would help you build your brand a little bit. And of course it has because the videos, you know, get a bunch of views and he's on them and that brings in like some of a Twitter following. So that, that collaboration was more to, to, uh, because he had been doing good work. He'd been doing it for a long time and I appreciated that. So I was like, let me help you build your own personal brand. Uh, Mike is someone that I just really trust with dynasty content. And I think he's really good at it. So I was like, yo, we're going to start pivoting more towards like dynasty shit. Why don't you come on and talk with Noah about it? And I kind of um, almost outsourced that content to them because one, I think they're more into dynasty than I am. And two, like, as I start to need to work on other things around the business more so, it's awesome that I could have two people that I really trust putting out really quality content once a week on uh, on something like dynasty that's relatively new and we can kind of take hold of, of that piece of the market. Right. Cause it comes down to like, I really, really trust them doing that shit. And they've, you know, given me no reason not to, cause we've, they've done probably five or six shows already by themselves where I'd be like, yo, I'm getting on with you guys tonight. Like we'll do a three way. And then like 10 minutes before I'm like, yo, something came up. I can't do it. And it's like, that's the last thing I send. And then the next morning they have a video up with the fucking, you know, everything's done. Like I don't have to worry about that shit. And I've been able to outsource yeah. to them because, because I trust them. So long winded answer. I'm sorry, but, um, realistically the whole collaboration shit was not what I wanted to do from the start. And to this day, it's not, it's not what I prefer as my main pieces of content. I like to do not, not because I like to be like the face of it, but I'm the most comfortable when I'm just doing shit by myself. Oh, no, I definitely agree with that. I also like making content better by myself. So I think it's funny how you said at the beginning, you were kind of like scared to tell people because I didn't tell anyone at all. And then my friends were researching for their draft and they found my YouTube channel and then the group chat's <laughs> blowing up. Holy shit, Nick, look at you. You're doing this. Blah, blah, blah. And it's funny. I don't know. That's just a weird uh, story to bring up real quick. That but, is uh, funny. Were they giving you shit for it? No, they thought they, it was cool. Or they, they were genuinely like, excited. Yeah, yeah, they were like, how do you have a thousand subscribers? I've never even heard. I didn't know you were doing this. And I was like, yeah, I do it every single day, multiple times a day. <laughs> I just that's that awesome fun. good for you yeah definitely it was great so uh at the beginning was it a challenge to you kind of talked about this but were you was it really a challenge to just 
figure out how to record and everything? Did you like have to watch some videos of how to set shit up when you're in wherever you were when you recorded those first few videos or did you have to, or did you kind of know how to do it? Uh, no, I definitely didn't know how to do it. I had no experience doing it prior to YouTube. Um, but that shit is the easy shit, man. Just yeah. like the physical stuff behind getting these videos done is the fucking easy part of it. You just get a shitty camera, you get a shitty microphone, and you hit fucking power on both of them, and you're ready to go. The other shit is the hard work, like putting in the re like researching for six hours for a 30 minute video, right? And then editing that hour of video to make sure that it's good quality content and then doing the thumbnail and shit like that. So, in terms of like physically getting the video done in the beginning, yeah, I mean, obviously the production quality was fucking terrible and I still don't think it's really that good, but it's obviously improved tremendously since I started. But that stuff is, yeah, I mean, all the physical tang tangible shit out there, like it's as easy as going to Google or YouTube and just typing in how to. That, that's really yeah. what it comes down to. And if you can't figure that out for yourself, then you've, you've got a long way to go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, all you got to do is type into YouTube. You can figure out how to do pretty much everything on YouTube just by searching it on YouTube, like how to make thumbnails and stuff. It's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. To yeah anyone there's who a million resources out there. Yeah, definitely. So obviously we're going to go to now. We just talked about before pretty early. So at the beginning, you kind of became, or eventually you became kind of a mogul of the fantasy football community. You're pretty big right now. So, and you emphasize being selfless a lot. So what helped you grow, not as a content creator, but as a person, did this really help you grow more as a person as well? Just doing this? Uh, yeah, of course. I, th I think uh, growing as a person, I think would come more so just from life experiences, um, mm -hmm. you know, things that have gone wrong. And yeah, there, there are things in business, I, I guess, that have gone wrong that have helped me grow as a person. But I would say, um, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'd really consider myself a selfless person. I think most of the selfless things I do are in some way or another, like selfish, you know, there is some roundabout way that they help me. But I also think that that's kind of like, to be a truly selfless person, you're like a really good person. But I think there's usually motive behind most things. And they can, you know, you could have it both ways. I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that I operate that way. Um, I, I would say that this has, this has definitely taught me a lot about patience. This has taught me a lot about what really goes into things, right? Like uh -huh. building up something from the foundation, it just takes an unbelievable amount of time. Like I've been doing this for five or six <laughs> years and I'm nowhere near where I want to be. And like, you've been doing this for a while now too. And, and I'm sure you're nowhere near where you want to be. But if you can uh -huh. go, let me ask you this. If you can go, if you had, if you had to go back and do it all again, would you put in the three years of work that you did again, having to do the exact same things? Like, sometimes I think about that and I'm like, I don't know if I could do that, that the amount of work I did to build this foundation again. I really don't. Yeah, no, I'm not sure to be honest with you. I mean, I wish I started earlier to be honest with you. Cause I've been watching, I watched your content when I was like 15, 16 years old. I'm 20 now. So I should have just started when I saw all this, the footballers and stuff popping off. So that kind of pisses me off thinking about that. Cause I could be huge mm -hmm. right now, but yeah, I would definitely have done it differently though. I would have, you know, you put my face on there at the beginning. I was too scared to show myself. A lot of people would comment about what I look like. They still do, but it's okay. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah. And I wish I, mean, I wanted a better Going back. Too. Yeah. Going back and, and thinking about what you could do differently. That's another thing you think about, right? Because there's so much that you would have changed, but like you, that's something that you learn. It's just like, you can't change, you can't change anything that you've gone through. Right. And that's, that's not just from a YouTube sense. That is, that's real life. So when you go through shit that you wish you had done differently, what choice do you have? All you can do is look forward positively and, and make the best of, of what you have right now and take the lessons that you learn from there. So yeah, yeah, there are a lot of things that overlap between YouTube and business and, and real life. So I've learned a lot, but I would just say overall, just like experiences in and out of YouTube are, are what help you help you grow as a person. I will always plug Gary V as well. I think Gary V is like the, the, the best person on the fucking planet and has helped me out mentally more than um, than, than anyone in the world. So if you guys have not checked out Gary Vaynerchuk, just go listen to uh, Gary V, the audio experience, his podcast. Um, he for real, for real has had the biggest impact on me of, of any person in my life. Yeah, I, I watched you know, he has the no fucking idea who I am. <laughs> I've watched that interview you did with Sky on your channel. It was like a year ago, maybe. And you talked about Gary V for like 20 minutes. It was like a full suck off session of him, but it was, I kind of <laughs> learned a lot about him. So I looked him up and I listened to some of his stuff. So I'm not really a podcast guy, though, it's except for fantasy. So I don't really listen to him all the time, but I know who he is now.
Makes sense. So, yeah, I listen to him like once, if not twice a day. I know Sky was Sky was a big Gary V guy too. So anytime you get me in a room with someone else who likes Gary V, it's like it's fucking all bets are off. Yeah, it was a Gary V Palooza for like thirty minutes. It was great. So <laughs> yeah, but no other way, baby. Exactly. So obviously now we're in the off season. So do you feel like there's a lot of pressure, more pressure creating content in the off season versus in the season? And do you like one more than the other? Because I asked this to Snacks and Animal, and they both had the exact same answer. I think the it's almost like an analogy of, of the off season. I, I almost think about it the same way I think about when you're starting out, right? Like those first couple of years of doing content when you're getting no fucking engagement and you know, you're not like really building much. It's, it's really like a brick by brick mentality of like one subscriber, five subscribers, 15 subscribers. That's almost like the off season in a sense. Like you need to like put now it's getting more popular and you get way more engagement on like off season content, obviously. But like for a long time, you weren't getting a lot of content or you weren't getting a lot of engagement and subscribers and all that shit in the off season. Right. Cause everyone was just focused on it during July and August. Yeah. But I think that's so important to have that foundation because you don't want people to just roll up on you in August and then look back and be like, okay, well, you know, he, it, I, you need to have that foundation there. So people know that you have been working towards this and they know that you know what you're talking about. And that's the same thing with the beginning growth of it. So uh, off season content, there is, there is definitely a heightened sense of pressure just because so many people are doing it now, right? Cause yeah. we have dynasty becoming popular and there are people who are niching down in that. And there are, you know, every day there's like fucking 20 new YouTube channels popping up about fantasy football and they're willing to like, when you're at that level, when you're down here, I'm just talking about in terms of numbers, not in terms of like the work or the content that you put out. But when you're down here, you have no choice but to outwork the person that's up here or you're never going to even come close to closing that gap, right? So when yeah. those people are down here and they're working their fucking asses off, that's like, I can't, you know, you can't let up. So yeah, there's, there's an underlying pressure there because it becomes more and more saturated and you're just like, you're, you're not going to stay on top of the fucking throne by just sitting there, right? You have to be off the throne. You have to continue to fucking innovate and continue to create content. And uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a heightened sense of pressure. And uh, I watched both the interviews that you did with, with Snacks and Animals, so I know what their, what their answer was. And this is something I've said a few times before. The offseason is, is a great time, right? Because it gives you a lot of flexibility with the content that you want to do, right? Uh -huh. uh, when you're in the summer, it's like you kind of know you have to nail down a lot of the popular videos because that's when the engagement will be like exponential. But in the summer, you have flexibility to put out whatever you want, when you want to do it. And this is a problem that I kind of ran across last year was like – I. I should fucking do that any time of the year. Like, I don't, I don't need the summer to dictate when I should be like happy putting out content. If I want to do some sort of content now, or if I want to do that in fucking July, I'm just going to do that. But yeah, the off season, you have a lot more, um, it, things aren't time sensitive, right? You can just kind of do whatever the fuck you want, whenever you want. And, uh, it, the quality of the content will probably turn out pretty good, but in the summer and like during the season and stuff, it's like, everything is so time sensitive. We have a new report today that you know, goes against what you said yesterday. So now you need to make an updated about it. So it gets a little crazy. I would definitely prefer the off season content just because it, um, it, it gives you more flexibility in, in what you want to create. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. Like trying to get on the ball. Cause during the off season, when it was like the free agency time, I would just post like a three minute clip of me talking about whoever gets signed. That shit gets like 4,000 views. It's like the easiest thing ever, but you just gotta be mm -hmm. sitting there staring at Twitter for a shefty tweet in order to get it done. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, um, it's funny, we were talking about the off-season stuff because when you say it changes so often, we were having – people just had conversations about MVS versus Geronimo Allison, like every – okay, so we were talking about MVS and Geronimo Allison and how all this off-season content is so funny because you will have these arguments in the off-season, like this guy versus this guy all summer long, and it turns out they both fucking suck. So how do you feel when stuff like that happens? Like when the, you invest so much in, say, one guy, you're like – talking about him all summer you're saying this is my guy must own running backs carry on johnson's on the thumbnail and he sucks what do you think about that how do you feel <laughs> um i actually i'm not sure i would like to do a study on this down the road I'm, I'm unsure whether or not it fucking matters to be honest uh because you're gonna go back and now everyone puts up like the must own running back videos and you're gonna go back and in all those videos like you're gonna be right about two of them you're gonna be wrong about two of them and everyone's kind of at the same rate yeah. So I'm curious as to whether or not it actually affects the success you have or it affects the sales that you have or it affects like the engagement overall that you have on any of those things. In terms of like, how do I feel when I get it wrong? I mean, obviously I feel a little bit shitty, but like I've, I've 
probably taken a different approach going forward in that like I look at things on a, a range of outcomes now, right? I try not to put a stamp on a player unless I really, really, really love them. I'm like, I, I always try to look at things from both sides, right? Play devil's advocate, even on the guys I like. So if you are taking my word to invest in a guy, I'll also, I'll also try to say, you know, here's a reason, you know, maybe why you want to pull back a little bit, you know, X, Y, Z, like, don't say I didn't fucking tell you about this. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I try to um, always see things from both sides, no matter how much I like a guy. So yeah, it feels shitty when someone's like, you fucked up and told me to draft X, Y, Z, and it costs me my league. And I'm just like, all right, well, you're a fucking grown ass man. So make your own choices. That's what it really comes down to at the end of the day. Oh, yeah, no. At the beginning, I was a lot more worried about that. Like, when I'd get comments, oh, you made me lose. And then, like, eventually I kept growing and I'd get a million comments about that. I'm like, whatever. Like, I tried. Like, you don't <laughs> need to take just my advice. Go ask some other people. Think about it yourself. And then you can figure it out. So, obviously, right now, uh, you do the interview series. You've been doing it for a while now. I think this is three years, maybe two years that you've been doing it. So, how did you decide you wanted to interview other people? And how do you decide who you want to interview? Um... That interview series, the behind the business is something that, you know, I, I talk about how I don't really love fantasy that much, or I don't love like sports in general anymore, which is so weird because I was just like obsessed with sports growing up. Right. I played it my entire life and watched it and was such a fan. And now like, as I'm growing older as a person, there's just, you see like the lack of depth to what sports really are. You know what I mean? Like I understand that there's like raving fans behind it and it does bring people together, but the sense of sports sometimes, if it's not something I'm like directly really interested in, it's like a waste of time. Like, I can't believe there, that there are people out there who's like, this is going to sound bad, but like whose lives are shitty enough that they're excited about this Korean baseball league that's about to start happening. It's like, dude, I understand that like you miss sports, but like you can't like you're, the outside life of, of, of sports can't be so shitty that you need to fucking invest your time watching baseball of these guys who you have no idea who they are. So when it comes to the business series, in a sense, um, sorry, I, I always give like really long winded answers and I don't realize I'm doing it until I'm in the midst of the conversation. It's, it's okay. But the, the reason I preface with that is because I just have a lot of different passions that I want to um, intertwine into my content and, and business and marketing had been a part of my life for, you know, the, the previous five years. And I'm like, yo, it's cool to talk to other people that understand it or maybe don't understand it, but are like coming into their own of, of trying to grapple with it and, and figure out different techniques and figure out different things within the marketing sense. So like the, the, um, the interview series itself was, was, you know, it, there was motivation for, from a few different angles. Like I do love the sense that I could help people out that are starting out that have no fucking idea from a marketing background or how to begin in the industry. So when I'm choosing who I want to bring on, it's always from, it's not like who can I grab that has the most followers? Like there are guys that I straight up don't want for the interview series that have massive amounts of followers. So I'm just like, I don't, there's no, there's no value to extract from that person that I haven't already got from someone else. You know what I mean? So there, you could obviously do that shit, but for the way I look at it, it's like, can you bring a unique angle? Can you bring a unique viewpoint? Are you doing something really, really well? Have you innovated in a sense? And if I could find something that differentiates a person, then I, I love to bring them on for that. So that's kind of how I choose it. And I think like, um, there are people that do a lot of really cool things in the industry that I don't know about that do better than me in certain angles. And I'm like, when I'm interviewing them, my interviews are for the audience to gain value. A lot of the time it's for me to, to learn from them because what other way am I going to, you know, extract that value from them? So uh, there's a lot of different angles to it, but I would say at the end of the day, like that, that kind of stuff is something I'm, I'm deeply, deeply passionate about. Okay. So obviously right now, uh, where you've gotten to now, obviously you're pretty big. So how do you feel about how you kind of have like an impact on other people's lives? Like you kind of inspire other people because these business type of videos do really show you how to try to do what you're doing. So how do you feel that you're like to some people, like to me, you're like one of my idols. Like I look up to what you do. I look up to Barstool, other things like that, but you're one of those main idols. So how do you feel that, that you impact people's lives like that? I, I, I would say, first off, I really, I, I appreciate that. I really do. I kind of, I just had like goosebumps run through me. I'll be <laughs> honest. Um, I, 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 it, it's definitely humbling. My, my concern with a lot of like inspiration and motivation and shit is that it's, it lacks depth. It's almost like an entertaining version of motivation, but I appreciate when someone like you tells me that because I understand that you're actually putting in a lot of hard work behind the inspiration. So mm -hmm. 
what I try to do is, yes, I do try to inspire people, but not directly inspire people. It's like, I only want to show transparency and truth because that's what inspires people, right? Like you can go back to my vlogs and show me when I first started in my mom's fucking house and some kid, like if you watch it, then you might be like, this kid's so full of shit, but you can watch it now and be like, oh shit. Like this is, that's, that's, it's just fucking real. Like that's the work you need to put in to get to here or to get to where you're going. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that I can inspire people. I just hope that the inspiration doesn't last for 20 minutes after watching my video and you can actually put action yeah. behind it like that that's what gets me excited about people being inspired and people doing things with that inspiration so I don't I don't like try to inspire people I try to show them realness behind what's going on and that in turn is is inspiration in itself you know like the whole like motivation rah rah shit is not <laughs> real like that doesn't yeah. work for people right like showing people that you relate to them that you're going through difficult situations and you overcame something similar to what they're going through tells them that like, Oh fuck, I can also overcome that. And I can also do X, Y, Z. So that's the kind of inspiration I'm trying to do, but it's not like an inspiration centric or driven yeah, yeah. content that I do. You know what I mean? So, um, so thank you. I guess like, I don't, I don't get too wrapped up in it. I just hope that people really take action behind the, the motivation or inspiration that, that they do get from me. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Is there anything you talked about overcoming something? Was there anything when making videos or at any time really during the fantasy stuff that you really felt like you had to overcome something? Honestly, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. That's like really black and white. I think of like, I don't know. I, I always think of like this, this one poster that it was in like my middle school class and it's you a lot of people have probably seen it it's this poster about abraham lincoln right mm -hmm. and it's the poster of all the shit that he has failed all the all the elections and stuff that he's lost right it's like he lost his his town council meeting or whatever and there's like 50 fucking things that he lost and then eventually like the last four things on the bottom are like things that he won and it was like xyz the presidential campaign or whatever and i think a lot of people think about success and failure very black and white like oh you failed the test or you passed the test and i've yeah. never looked at failure that way i think of failure and success as very uh very gray it's a very gray area there's nothing i would never put my life in a situation where like one thing is going to choose whether or not i have success so the overcoming thing is almost just like a day in and day out being in the right mindset continuing to stay motivated and con continuing to stay true to you know, who you are and what, and what you're trying to build. So overcoming, um, I would say like the hardest thing I've had to do was, was continue to have a strong mindset and stay positive about things and, you know, deflect off of, of burnout and things like that. But I think as long as you're self-aware about who you are as a person and, and what you want to achieve, um, you shouldn't, uh, hopefully you don't put yourself in a position <laughs> where like one or two things are like the difference between success and failure for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I understand that. Maybe one of Abraham Lincoln's failures was like chopping wood incorrectly or something. That might have been on there as well. Yeah, that probably was on the fucking list. And it probably drove me crazy when I was 11 years old. Yeah, you were just getting so inspired by an <laughs> Abraham Lincoln poster in your history class or something. Look, it's fucking Abe right there playing ball. Oh, hell yeah. The new background's <laughs> looking good. I like it. I like how uh, you moved it. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I can't really figure out like what to do with this entire open space space here <laughs> so i don't know it, it works for now but there will there will be changes once we end up building the fucking table with that wood we'll have a different background but for now for now it works it's good enough okay <laughs> so obviously now you guys you started with the slack and then you brought in the discord so what made you what was your inspiration behind that because i'm in the discord there's like a shit ton of people in there like if you leave the notifications on your phone will die in like three seconds because there's that many people talking so how did you <laughs> what was your decision behind doing that uh the discord was well we started with the slack and then we moved to the discord honestly the conversation i had with joe holka on my channel him talking about discord he said it was just like a much easier transition for people to interact and also you can get your patreon members that go yeah. directly into discord which is cool but that wasn't really the main motive behind the, the community as a whole was really like yo, this dynasty stuff is really there for the taking. And if we become the middleman for everything in between, like not only do we provide the content, you get excited about the content. You're like, okay, like I want to talk about the content. Okay, I want to join a fucking dynasty league. And we're like, yo, why don't we also be that step to the process, right? So we kind of, we want to take over the entire fucking food chain when it comes to dynasty stuff. So this was a way to build the community uh, within dynasty 
And when we start, you know, selling the products, the dynasty, the, the dynasty guide and, and all yeah. of this stuff, whatever we want to do, whatever, however we want to branch out in the dynasty world, we're going to be able to do that because we're building the audience behind it. And we're the ones that, you know, provide the infrastructure behind everything that you could want dynasty wise. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I joined a league on there and the only reason why I joined it was because I was like, you know what, let me uh, get into the dynasty. I make content about it. I'm fucking lying to the people if saying I don't, <laughs> I never said I played. I only started making videos. The first one I made was with Noah about dynasty once I joined a league, but yeah. It's I honestly, saw that draft board. I saw the draft board and someone took David Montgomery at like 305 or 306. Yeah. I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> yeah, no, your, your listeners are crazy, man. <laughs> It was fun, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that, we got to start giving them better advice. Yeah, honestly, fucking Noah and Mike are failing them, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I just thought that step was it up. Well, I'll have a word with them after this. Yeah, definitely. Tell them not to draft David Montgomery that early. Hopefully they, they understand. <laughs> so, obviously, now we're going to go and pivot into talking about, like, podcasts. So, I know you spoke about this at the beginning. We talked a little bit about Fade the Public. So, and I talked to Max and Snacks about it as well. So, what really inspired you guys to create it? You, I know it's about, like, the league, but... What made you be like, you know what, this will be great. Like this, people listen to this. I just don't think there's anything out there that's like this. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are shows where you like follow leagues and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think if we could put an element of, like I said, like a reality show behind it, but like real, like obviously we're not going to fake shit about it. Like a reality show element to it, it'll bring people in and like really, really excite them. So my, my whole fade the public thing when I wanted to start it out was completely like a brand play. I was just like, yo, people are going to love this shit. I think it could turn out to be something really, really, uh, really fun. And again, I, 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 we haven't gotten anywhere close to what I, what I want it to be or where I think it could go. We're still kind of like doing a very typical podcast about shit, but we will pivot eventually and it will be something that becomes much, much much larger like a, a, it's going to be like a fucking piece of production when when each of those videos go out it's not going to be just like a podcast thing so um yeah the inspiration was just like this is going to be really fun for the audience and it's a way to follow a league in which people are really going to to, to buy into not just like following yeah. along when people you know talk about their league for like 10 seconds on a podcast yeah, I also think it's funny if you look back at, like, the first episode of the show compared to now, like, how different it looks. Like, the camera's in a weird place. There's no microphones and stuff <laughs> at the beginning. It's just funny. So what made you really change to make it try to look more professional? Um, well, I, I, would, I would say, like, the first few episodes were, like, were irresponsible to fucking put out. There, <laughs> there was such bad quality of, of like video and there was one video where like I think my audio you couldn't hear for 30 minutes and one yeah, video no, where it's funny the camera like blanked out for 30 minutes yeah so it, it was almost like a forced choice it's like okay we, we can't put this out because it's so fucking bad but <laughs> but but like animal and snacks were we're getting like we're starting to get really into it and I was like yo if you guys are down to it like we can invest money into making this a better you know, a better podcast. And it's up, to, it's up to you guys to decide how far the, sh the same thing I did with Mike and Noah. And I'm like, you guys are going to make this show your own. Like, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart, like, yes, you're putting it on my YouTube channel for the audience, but like you guys will take it as far as you want to take it. That's the same ultimatum that I gave to animal and snacks, you know? And I'm like, listen, I want this to be your guys' show. Yes, I'm in the league. And of course I have the experience with podcasting and shit, but like you guys are ultimately either going to buy into this and make this your life or you're not going to. And the show will go as far as that. And for the most part, there have been instances where I do question the, be completely honest, the, the um, I guess the dedication to it from maybe from both sides, but altogether it's like they they have bought into the process and they're just like i'm down to invest whether it's production quality or investing a shitload of time or resources or whatever it is and uh and that's what kind of made us step up the production quality i obviously want to make it good too because it's got my name on it and it's on my channel um but it was a it was a team effort just being like listen we're gonna go all in on it or we're not to and and we're not or we're not going to and uh and let's you know let's invest in making this better yeah, for sure. Now, I know you talked about this. I'm not sure which interview it was, but you're talking about how you wanted to make the Fade the Public like cookbook type of deal. So what really made you be like, you know what, this will be funny? Like, like what uh, came into that idea? I never thought about doing it until, until like when we do video footage of the, those two fucking assholes cooking, it's <laughs> like they have like a new level of like wit that unlocks in their heads and they're like funny and the banter is great. And they're like side commentary is super funny. And I'm like, yo, this is like, 
legitimately really enjoyable content. Like I love watching the videos <laughs> of you guys cooking stuff. And I'm like, the audience will like that too. And when we can be together and make more video content like that, it's just, it's just, you know, I understand the value that we're bringing to the audience is, is not like necessarily all the, like, you, you know, bunk bed breakdowns and fade the public couldn't be further from each other in terms of the value <laughs> that we bring to the audience, right? Like one is stupid, funny, reminds you of you being with your friends, right? Fade the public. And then bunk bed breakdowns is giving you the numbers and analytics behind dynasty shit. So I'm like, okay, long-term plays, like what, what service are we going to be providing to the audience when it comes to fade the public? And I'm like, we're not going to make like a, another fantasy fade the public football draft guide, right? Like that's not what we're going to provide. So I'm like, let's, let's spin off. It's almost like a Barstool thing where it's like their products are, are their merch, right? It's just like, yeah. they're selling their lifestyle of being funny and being creative and shit like that. And that's the direction I see fade the public going. Right. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a mix of being offering, tons of different types of content and then making sure that whatever you're offering from that content is uh, relating to that content and what part of the content the, the audience actually likes. So I think like the cookbook, if we put it up for like 10 bucks and people who watch those videos see animal and snacks, like cooking shit up, they're going to be excited. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I've dropped $10 on a cookbook from them. And I think like, it would be cool to have like a video cookbook, but also make like 15 to 20 hand signed copies and send them out via the mail. Like I, th I think people, I think that would sell well because those two are like really funny when they're in their fucking cook mode, you know? Yeah. I might have to just drive down to Max house and get one of those huge ass cookies he makes every night. Bro, he like <laughs> makes him like he had a streak in, in the beginning of quarantine where he would send pictures of it like every single day in Slack. And they're like this, they're they're huge, but they looked really fucking good. And I was like, Animal, you've got a you've got like a secret there, man. We need to unlock this secret to the world. Yeah. How did you feel like doing the draft stuff like for the NFL draft this year? Cause I know I I watched it after because I was live streaming Snacks and Max came on, but Snacks was just absolutely hammered when he got to come on my show. He was he chugging a bottle of wine. It was amazing. But how did that feel like doing that for so long since it's such like a long form type of deal, like six hours a day? Yeah, it was uh <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I just like, we thought of the idea like a month ago and I was like, yo, we're going to live stream for the entire draft. And I, I don't know, but we had a lot of people stick around for the entirety of the thing. So it, it was definitely fun. I, I would, I don't, I want to say I'll do it again next year. Cause hopefully I'm, I'm, I'll be physically wherever the NFL draft is. That's, that's another fun trip that we're probably going to look to plan. Yeah. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. Too. It was, it was tough. It was tough to like, figure out how we wanted to do it logistically because Noah and Mike are like, you know, the analytics guys and they, they give a lot of value via, you know, stats and breakdowns and things like that. But obviously we can't do that for six fucking hours, especially when you have, you know, four or five guys that are like defensive players being picked in like an hour span. We're, we're not gonna be able to break them down. Um, yeah. And then we're going to be chilling with the audience for six hours. So obviously we got to do shit. That's not just straight like analytics and, and that kind of breakdown. So it, it was tough to kind of figure out, how we wanted to do it um but we i don't know we did it and i don't really know how it turned out we did it live and i will never watch those videos again yeah no i went back and watched uh herbert get drafted to see noah's reaction and that was the funniest shit i've ever seen yeah it was very it was a very uh daniel jones getting drafted snacks x-esque um reaction from noah yeah, no, that that was great. So um, pivoting on to another thing, uh, we just started talking about Noah, but what made you think to go from Noah from writing to more of being in your videos? Like what caused that jump? Yeah, we, it was what I said before. It was it was strictly that uh, I wanted to grow his, his personal brand more. Um, I think like, the, I mean, he, he, he surrounded himself with me, right? Like he's, he, again, like... It's almost in the sense that like my name, you know, my name is on the Fade the Public podcast. Like my name is also on the people that work, that help me, right? The, my yeah. team, right? Because I'm the one that decides that they're going to help me. So, but no, I'm like, um, I, I want to help build your personal brand. I want to help build the personal brand of everyone on my team. Because I think when you associate yourself with people that have their own power and kind of like infrastructure, it's, it's a full circle thing. It helps you out. It helps them out. It helps the business out, the brand out, whatever. So yeah, for Noah, it was just like, dude, you're putting in so much fucking work and we're not, you're, you're squeezing like a, a fucking 
a lime that's that's long overdue and you're getting no juice from it. So let's, you know, get you fucking to a grocery store, get a fresh batch of limes and, and fucking pump your numbers up a little bit, get you on video and get some views, you know? Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I just think it's it's great that you bought him like a fucking laptop because he joined one time and he sounds like he's within a jet engine or something, like his computer was that <laughs> loud. It was so funny. But uh, yeah. obviously we were talking about Noah. So obviously he's one of the members of Bunk Bed Breakdown. So what made you want to put a show that's not necessary. I mean, Fade the Public is your show, more of your show than Bunk Bed Breakdowns, at least looking from the outside in. So what made you want to bring in Mike and Noah together to form this show? Uh, Mike is just someone I really trust with Dynasty shit. Like he's better at Dynasty than I am. And Mike's been like a long-term follower of mine. He's probably been subscribed to the channel since like you have. And uh, he's always someone that is like commented in the, in the comment section of the videos. And then he came to the New York City um, live draft vlog weekend for both weekends so far. He's come back to back. And since then, obviously, we've formed a friendship. I mean, me and Snacks yeah. met him in, um, in Nashville for the draft last year. So me and Mike have gotten close over the years. And, I, and the first ever Dynasty League I started was a startup with my subscribers. And he was in it. And he won the first year. And then he beat me last year in the championship in it. So <laughs> I, just, I just really – think Mike has a good grasp on dynasty and I'm like, yo, like I could put out content, but like, I actually trust Mike's opinion when it comes to dynasty. So let him provide content to the audience. I know Noah, um, I kind of just like forced this on him to be honest with you. I didn't really ask him. <laughs> if, if I was like, yo, do you want it? I think I might've asked him, but, um, he he's into dynasty as well. So I was like, you guys can be a, a good pair. Cause I really, really trust you guys to do it. And I know that had the skills production wise to make sure that the piece of content went out. Like when I was away, in uh in in was it january or whatever january, yeah. i yeah i went on a trip for like a while and we had not missed an episode of fade the public for the year or year and a half that we had been doing it so far and i was like yeah animal and snacks like i'm gonna be gone so i'm not doing the episode with you but like i don't know what you guys want to do if you want to keep it going do so but like i can't help out of course so i was I, w I was way more nervous for them because i don't think they have any sort of like production background but animals are an extremely, extremely resourceful dude, like very, very underrated skill of animals is like, if I get if I ask him to do something, he'll get it done, right? It might, I don't, I don't, he might have some questions along the way, but like, he'll figure some shit out if I need him to figure it out for me. So um, I was a little nervous about them actually getting an episode up that was like of some sort of quality content. And to be honest, I didn't watch him. So they could have been like the shittiest videos ever. <laughs> but they got one chains on it. And I know he's a funny motherfucker, too. So it couldn't have been that bad. So uh yeah, I mean, I just think it's about understanding the people that you're working with and what kind of like workload you can put on their plate. And with Noah and Mike, I have nothing but but trust for them, and they've given me no reason to look at them otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I know this question's kind of a bit more off topic, but I know at the beginning you started the draft guide a couple of years ago, and I asked Max this question. I asked Max if he thinks he would be able to do it, and he said, "Fuck no, like it's too complicated. He would never be able to figure it out." So, how did you do it from the beginning? Because I know like your first draft guide was like it was like a ebook. So what made you want to do that? And how did you decide to make it, why you wanted to make it change to be what it looks like now? Um, I'll be honest, bro. I kind of hate the way that I changed it to how it is now. I think the audience kind of likes it probably because it's, it, it's a lot cleaner. Uh -huh. That first draft guide I did, I will never in my life forget that, bro. It was like, <laughs> it was like 200 pages long. And when I tell you, like, how did I create that? That's something I could never go back and do again. I think I put like hundreds and hundreds of hours into making that thing. I went page by page, like designing it. And I'm like, bro, I respect my like 24 year old self so much more than I respect who I am right now because of the work that I put in back then. So it was like, uh, I had just been putting out a lot of content for a long time for free. And, it, and my mindset wasn't like, okay, let's try to make some money. I was like, what if, you know, what if I put something together where you know, something I've realized very quickly in business is that people don't necessarily pay for, information or something that they're finding valuable what they're paying for is is organization yeah. people pay for organization and i was like if i could find a way to organize everything i've been putting together that was it i was like yo i want to help you guys out and and organize the fucking 300 hours of video content that i put out for the summer um and i'll slap like a really low price tag on it it was i think i sold it for 4.99 the first copy and I'll put a really low price tag on it only because I'm going to be spending so fucking long um, making it, you know? And I was like, okay, like it, it would be cool to be compensated by it. So it was, it was a true, true act of, of 
trying to help people in the sense of organizing everything that I put out that summer and then putting it together was just like, Oh man. Cause everything was like the images were like handmade on Canva and then posted into the draft guide. And then if like one ranking changed, I need to change all of the rankings within Canva and then repost it onto, um, and then repost it onto the draft guide, like image by image. It was, it was such a shit show, but like, man, I love that first draft guide so much. Like the heart of it, the heart of that product was like one of the best things I think I'll ever put out. Yeah. I mean, at least you're not drawing the pictures like Max was for whatever that shit was that he wrote up. That was so funny. Yeah. You know what? Like I would like to have that in the draft guide, man. Like everything we do, I want at the end of the day, like I want this to be a lifestyle brand, you know? So like, I want that to be intertwined. I feel like the draft guide, while I like the the content in itself has gotten way better, obviously from an analysis standpoint and the organization is on point. It, it, it feels like just something else that another company would make. And I'm like, Ugh, I hate that. I just don't know if I have time to make that entire switch over to something that's cooler and like better looking and stuff. But eventually it will go back to the same feel that we had the first year that we did it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I, I like the, how the draft, the old draft guide looks. That's like a whole vibe over there. It's like, it's just so funny, but you know I what guess- I mean? Like, that's what I mean. It's like, this, there was really a fucking vibe to it. It was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's funny. But uh, now, obviously, you do the draft guide stuff, but you also have a Patreon. So what made you be like, you know what, let me start this Patreon thing? Because people asked me to start it last year, and I didn't do it. And I'm kind of regretting it because I was like, you know how many people would have joined that shit? Like, how stupid are you, Nick, you dumbass? Like, I just think about that all the time, like how much money I probably could I mean, you could start now. What are no, you I did for? start one. I did okay. start one. Yeah. Um, Patreon was... I don't know, dude. I still haven't really figured out Patreon. I still don't know what I want to do with Patreon. I just see like people making <laughs> ridiculous amounts of money from Patreon. And yeah. I'm like, I know if I put some energy into it, we could probably make a shitload of money too. I just like really hate the notion of putting good content behind a paywall. You know, I really, I really hate just straight up doing that. And I'm okay doing it with the draft guy because again, people are not paying for the content really. They're paying for the organization of it. And with yeah. Patreon, it's, um, I don't know. I still haven't really figured out Patreon too much, but it was definitely, it was definitely more of like a money driven, um, a money driven choice. And I could like, that's the reason that's not like the direct reason why I haven't figured it out yet, but I could tell like the unconscious reasons behind why I'm having so much trouble with it. It's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel right to be honest. Okay. So um, I understand if you don't want to answer this question, I didn't even put this on the show sheet. So we could just fucking edit this out if you don't want to answer it. But how do you get into talks with these companies like drafters? Like, how does that go? Um, It depends what stage of like content creation you're out, you're at. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, a lot of the companies that I've worked with so far have been like fantasy jocks, of course, you know, I, I gave the history for that. Some of the other sponsors that we've worked with have just come from me reaching out to them. And I'm like, yeah, this is a really, really good fit. Here's what I have to offer. I'm going to email, you know, the head of their marketing company or whatever. Some like me working with draft was just like a beautiful fucking, I posted a, I posted a tweet of a, of a mock draft I did on the draft app or draft website or whatever. And I put a video clip of it on Twitter and someone commented under it like, yo, this is fucking awesome. I was like, thanks. I looked at the guy's page and it was like head of marketing for play draft. And I was like, Oh shit. Like he works at draft and he just watched the video. Like if, if he liked this, then I can make videos like this all the time for them. So I reached out to him. He happened to live in Brooklyn. Um, we, we got drinks one night. He took me into like the FanDuel office a couple of weeks later, we signed a, 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 an agreement with it. So that was just like a, a, a strike of luck, I guess you could say, but with drafters, I'm at the point where like I can provide exponentially more value to a lot of companies than they can to me outside of paying me a very high premium because like, <laughs> yeah, we as content creators have all the leverage, you know, like companies, companies, they can't sell their product or service unless someone's fucking buying it. And the people yeah. that they want to buy their product or service are the ones that are watching us. So they have to come through us in order to sell their products. And obviously we don't have a a big enough audience to be like, we control, you know, how your fucking product works and you know, who buys your product and shit. But at at the core sense of content creation, like we as an entire community of fantasy football podcasts control the audience and control the customers in a sense. So reaching out to a team like drafters, I was just like, if this is the value I can provide, like, are you interested in having a, a partnership and knowing pretty well that like, of course, you know, they're going to want access to my audience so we can make something work. And as, um, 
Yeah, it's kind of knowing where you're at in that stage and what leverage you have over your audience, what leverage you have over the company and, and knowing that it's a, it's a good fit for both sides and understanding that the value, you have to be able to convey the value to these companies um, very well when you reach out to them first. And they, you need to let them know that like your main interest is providing value to them. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. I know with my sponsorship, I won't say their name because it's going on your channel as well, but obviously they, they hit me up and I then started you could working say with it. them. I don't give a uh, shit. Overlay DFS, the c- company that does like DFS sports, but yeah, they, mm-hmm. they just DM me on Twitter. We're like, Hey, we're very interested in this. We watch your videos. I talk to them all the time. They're very nice there. So I just thought that was a little different to what you said. Cause you kind of, did you reach, you reached out to them, right? Um, for who? Uh, for, well, for fantasy or for uh draft, yeah yeah to- okay yeah i would say though actually the majority of them i've reached out for um i work with monkey knife right now and yeah, they reached out they had reached out to me <laughs> it's actually funny they dm'd us via via instagram and uh <laughs> that's how they found us and i was like yo you know we have like a, a pretty like sizable youtube channel i think that would probably be a uh, better <laughs> fit for us so they had reached out to us but yeah a lot of companies will do that they'll just find creators and it, i mean it makes it doesn't make uh sense not to not for for them to work with with creators because at the end of the day they don't a lot of the a lot of the contracts that you'll sign with them you're not getting paid unless someone signs up for their product you know so it's really no um it's really no downside for the company to to partner up with as many creators as, as possible okay so with the monkey knife fight thing what did you come up with the idea of putting the draft guide with it like that type of package or did they just come up with that they pitched that to me um i remember they I met with them. I met with them in Las Vegas for uh, for a night, uh-huh. and they had pitched it to me originally. And I didn't understand the concept at first. Maybe I was like too drunk, and we probably shouldn't have been like out while we were discussing this business <laughs> stuff. But originally, when they were like, "Do you have any interest in us sponsoring the draft guide?" I didn't actually know what they meant by that they I thought what they meant was like I would be plugging you know like how I made the magazine a few years ago like I would be plugging you know full pages of like monkey knife fights logos and information about them and shit when they said sponsoring like imagine like a magazine right like you have advertisements within a magazine that's what I thought they meant by it and my dumb ass and then (laughs) when they're like no what we mean by it is like having people sign up via monkey knife fight to get access to your draft guide Right. And I was like, oh, that could fucking work because um, it's a great it's a it's an amazing deal for the customer. Right. Like, I don't feel shitty about doing that because where they would normally pay like 30 or 45 dollars to get the draft guide. Now they're paying 10 dollars through Monkey Knife Fight while also getting to use that 10 dollars on Monkey Knife Fight, getting access to a 40. So I'm like, yo, this works all around. Like you guys get your customer onto the site. I get kickback from you guys, which is more than I would sell for the draft guide anyways. And then the customer (laughs) gets like 60 or 50 dollars of value for ten dollars. So. Um, they pitched that to me and I didn't actually know what the fuck they were talking about at first, to be honest with you. But, um, but it's been, uh, it's been a good deal so far. Yeah. was when you went to talk to them, was that at the fantasy like award show in Vegas? Yeah. Yeah. So they had been there and I had, I had planned on, on traveling already that month. Right. It was like at, towards the end of the season, I was like, I need to get the fuck out of like, you yeah. know, my, my desk and get away for a little while. So they had uh, asked me the rep I'd been working with asked me, he's like, are you going to be in Vegas for the conference? Cause they had already planned on going. And I was like, I, I'm not going to be because I was down in Florida visiting my grandparents. I went to New Orleans with snacks for the NCAA. Oh yeah. The NCAA championship, not Nashville for the draft. When I mentioned before with Mike, I, I met Mike in, in uh, New Orleans New for Orleans. the NCAA championship. That's what it was. And then uh, that happened to be the exact week the conference was. So I was like, I can't like go to the conference, but I can meet you there for a night. So I remember like, I remember going, my plane, it was like New Orleans. And the next day I had a plane to Vegas and we got in at like five and the conference was ending at like five. They just had like a happy hour going on. So I put my shit down. I went right over to like the happy hour that they were having. And I wasn't really supposed to be there, but they like let me under the little fucking (laughs) people that were inside, like let me under the little awning or whatever that was supposed to keep you out of the conference altogether. Uh Um, Yeah. The little, yeah, (laughs) that was a fucking word. The bouncer let you in there with the velvet rope thing. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what I felt like. I was like, I was like looking across. I see like fucking Matt Barry and like Brad Evans and shit. I'm like, I'm not really supposed to be here whatsoever. I just wanted to go on the roof and like fly the drone and shit. But um, I went there, yeah, and I met them at the after the uh, the conference, pretty much. Okay, so uh, did you? I know uh, I asked this to someone different. I don't even remember who it was, but obviously the footballers do that shit in person. You went to it last year. 
Uh, they sold out of tickets. I was going to go. I was pretty disappointed. I couldn't go, but I waited too long. But how do you feel like you, uh, you and Snacks and Animal could do that? Or maybe you know and Mike could do something like that? Or would you not be interested in turning into like a rock star like them, you know? Um, it's definitely something I've thought about. It's definitely something I'd be interested in. I think we're... I think we're really, really far off from successfully pulling that off, though. I think, uh, I think it would probably be like minimum three years before, before the content is good enough with those other. Like I said, like the, I think I would be able to do it by myself. I don't know if the content would be good enough to keep people engaged for like 60 minutes, but I think I'm the only one that would be prepared enough to be able to, you know, step on stage and actually give a show. The other, the other four, whatever Mike Noah's and whatever fucking combination you want to put together, <laughs> I don't think would be ready for it. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I've thought about it before and I, I think we're very far off and I don't think, uh, I think I'll know when I know, you know, it'll be like, okay, we're like ready for something like this. And you also have to have a massive fucking audience in order to sell out a physical location like that. You know what I mean? Because if you have a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube, like, you know, 20% of them are international. Um, yeah. And then like 5% of them are just in scattered states. So for you to be like, okay, you have to be available on a summer night, which is, you know, people are always booked during the summer and we're going to be in this location. You have to pay this amount. Like that filters your audience down to like 0.001% of the audience that can even qualify to be there. So you just need to have a massive volume of audience to even pull off something like that. Okay. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I was just figuring that I thought you guys would be good at doing that because it seems like it would, the podcast would tailor to doing it kind of in person, but, uh, I got another question here. So obviously you, uh, Scott's like a big part of your channel. I've talked to Scott a couple of times. He's very nice. So what made you decide to be like, I don't want to edit every video. Let me bring in Scott. And like, how did you meet him? Scott, Scott had, uh, Scott reached out to me actually. I think he emailed me. For, I wish I still had the opening email. He probably has it somewhere. He has like fucking 92 flash drives that he keeps everything stored in. So I'm, He's got I imagine on the he wall. has the, yeah, I'm, I imagine he has that email somewhere. Uh, he reached out to me, and I believe the content of the email was just something like, yo, I love, you know, he's, like, super passionate about fantasy football, super passionate about, like, the vlogging side of things. He's like, I love, you know, watching up-and-coming creators and things like that, and uh, I would love to help you out, you know, your channel or whatever. So it wasn't necessarily, like, me finding him. He reached out to me, and we had, like, a mutual – agreement up front I remember the first call we got on I was like yeah let's you know let's let's get on a call and we can figure things out a little more concretely and at that time I was still living at my mom's house I remember and I was like listen I don't have you know like you're you're a grown-ass man with a family like, <laughs> I can't I can't provide you financial value to the value that you're going to provide me in terms of you know taking time off my plate from a from a work standpoint but he was like, yeah, I understand that. Uh, this is more of like a long-term play. He's like one thing. He's, he like really believed in what I was doing, which was like the coolest thing, you know, when we were much smaller. He was like, I believe in what you're doing. And like long-term, I just want to be considered uh, for like part of the team when this thing kind of does blow up. So I paid him a little bit for a while and I pay him a little bit more now, but nothing compared to like what he's worth and the amount of hours that he puts in. Um, but it's a tough situation because, again, he has, like, a real life that he has tons of responsibilities for, and he can't just drop his shit to help Big Dog's got to eat out. I wish he could, Scott. But, um, yeah, he reached out to me, and uh, the rest has just been a partnership of, of just understanding. It's not like – I mean, some of the things are kind of official. We actually did sign our first contract, you know, just because the money is getting a little bit bigger where I feel like we, had, we should have something in place. But um, it's always been just, like, a mutual understanding of just, like, you know, we'll work things out when we need to. If like, if, if you're not good here, then I'll help out here and like vice versa and shit. So it's never like, I, I don't want the work to come in between like the, the friendship, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So obviously you guys do the E-Town Get Down League. So how did you decide to do these punishments that you do? And when are you going to waterboard someone? Because I've been waiting a couple of years. Uh, I mean, the punishments, we've been doing them for a while now. I think like five years or so. And it's just, uh, it's just fun. I mean, we just want to make the league fun. And like, what, what's funner than like some kind of public humiliation or having the loser, like if a lot of leagues fail because they don't have that type of engagement, especially towards the end of the year, where if you're not like top three or whatever, you know, shit just kind of falls out of the bottom. So we're like, yeah, of course we want to do a punishment. It wasn't like we were, we, we weren't like the first people that do a, a punishment in our yeah. fantasy football league, right? Like people have been doing that for a long time, but we just thought it was a good piece to keep the, keep the league fun keep it engaged and stuff like that. 
as for waterboarding, I mean, we, we make a big list every year of possible punishments and that goes up there. And, uh, it just, it, it's, listen, I'm a dictator, but I'm also democratic and I let the people vote for the punishment. Uh, that's always in my top three. It gets some points from me, but, uh, the collective group is not about the waterboarding, unfortunately. Yeah. I brought it up to my league too. They were, they were a little scared of getting waterboarded. I said, come on, it'll be fun. I'll put it on YouTube. It totally won't get demonetized. Like it'll be fine. That- it'll be a fun time. That was, I would like much prefer getting waterboarded to all the other, other punishments that are on the list. The other ones are like really fucking humiliating and, and time consuming. And like, you have to prepare for some of them. So I'm like, dude, waterboarding, you're done in 10, 15 seconds. It's funny. It sucks for 10 seconds, but like, you're going to be fine. I don't get why people don't want to pick that. I don't, yeah, I don't. no, I don't get it either. I mean, my league punishment was obviously uh, where I live. There's like a fun, like a, one of those run things where you do a 5k and the punishment is it's kind of like what you guys did, what Stevie had to do, but you got to like wear some fucking weird ass costume, but it's probably going to get canceled because of the Rona. So we're going to have to figure something else out. Yeah. It's like exactly what we did. Yeah, exactly. It was a kind of a copycat move. So obviously <laughs> now we're going to go to the uh, fantasy industry, talk about some of that. So uh, obviously the fantasy industry has a shit ton of people in it. A lot of them very good, some bad, but you know, it's okay. Do you draw inspiration from any of those guys? And if you do, how do you incorporate them into your own content? Um, that's a good question. In terms of like inspiration, uh, I, I do get inspired by some people like Brad Evans was someone that I was inspired by because he was, he's always like his goofy ass self, you know? And I was always like, you know, he built like a really strong brand based around like tequila for one, but like, you know, just based around him being this like eccentric, goofy, um, like funny guy. And I was like, yo, like people, you don't have to be so serious when you're doing this stuff and people can still, like love you so i i appreciate the authenticity behind behind brad um the footballers are an inspiration to me in terms of like the way that they've handled business um extremely extremely intelligent guys who are very very driven to to stay with you know the reason behind they started the reason behind like why they started the business and their their ability to despite becoming like almost mini celebrities in a sense, especially within our space have not changed or wavered who they are as people. Um, So that's especially inspiring as you continue to grow as, as a person, there are a lot of different, you know, opportunities and things that, that kind of come at you and it can be tough sometimes to, you know, keep your head level and, and, and continue to uh, pull inspiration from yourself for like the reason why you started things, you know? So those, those are the first two that come to mind. I think a lot of people inspire me, just, just the, the massive amount of hard work that goes into content creation. Like, even, like Nick, like even yourself, just like doing it every single day is something that inspires me. Cause I'm like, yo, these mm-hmm. kids are out here really fucking working and it makes me want to get up and, and make sure that I'm putting my fucking head into the books and doing the research and doing the editing and things like that. So um, again, it goes back to like truth. It's like people being authentic and people working really hard is what inspires me. Um, yeah, I would say I would say that's probably like uh probably the end of the list for for like pure inspiration. Okay, no, that that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you saying that too. So, how how do you feel like the market about fantasy football could be like any better? Cuz I feel like some people they don't market themselves good enough stuff like that. Um I I would say it's like a good problem to have. It's, it's another reason why I started the business interview series is because a lot of people don't understand the opportunity that's that's at hand. And uh, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to take the advice from that show whatsoever if they don't want to. Maybe they're happy just putting out content. I think the problem within the industry from the marketing side is that people don't have experience. It's a good problem because our industry is made, is is, is single-handedly created on just like straight passion. You know, people in our industry didn't start because they thought there was money there. There is money flowing in now, but almost nobody that started you know, blogging or YouTube or podcasting did it for money. They all did it because they were really passionate about, you know, fantasy football. So um, in terms of like doing marketing better, you're seeing a lot of, you're seeing the changes happening now, right? You're seeing people, like I made the draft guide and then like, you know, 10 different YouTube channels started making their draft guide, which is completely fine. It's a successful thing. You, you know, you see what works and then you start to do it. And I think that, we see that a lot like with establish the run, like those guys took their personal brands and realized that they have so much fucking leverage over the money, over the the brands and the deals that they make that they started their own thing. 
And then you see Graham Barfield and Scott Barrett and these guys make the fantasy points thing. And I'm like, I'm surprised they didn't do it earlier. And we're going to continue to see the people with the biggest brands start to understand that they have all the fucking leverage in these things. So yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of, um, in terms of that, it's like, I, I think content creators need to realize that they, they are the fucking heart, soul and the brain behind everything that happens within our industry. And you can't give leverage over, uh, over yourself to, to brands and stuff. But in terms of like, uh, also, you know, the platforms being on different platforms, um, people are, that's another thing, you know, I've gotten on, I've gotten on calls with almost every big name in the industry. Since I've done the business series, I've had a ton of, of the guys in the industry reach out to me um, just to get on a call for like an hour to talk to them about, you know, YouTube and, and, and this kind of stuff. And the, the, the thing I notice immediately is that because they've built a following via Twitter or a podcast that they think they deserve to have a following on YouTube. And I'm like, that couldn't be further from the truth. Like there's a whole nother, this is a whole nother platform you need to be on. Like, and a lot of people are stuck in their older ways where they've built this leverage from Twitter or blogging or whatever. And I'm like, that's incredible. And you have that audience, but that audience is not like, there's a reason they read your blog because they don't watch YouTube. So they're not going to follow you over to YouTube. So um, people need to, I, I think it's, it, it's sort of ego driven in a sense, and people need to be able to put that aside. So switching to new platforms and keeping your eyes open for where those things kind of emerge is, is another thing that people don't really do too well at in this industry. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what do you think YouTube is the next biggest platform or do you think it's something else? Because I noticed on Twitter, someone sent their tweeted this out and it was like some guy's fantasy football TikTok and has like 500,000 followers. I'm like, how the fuck? How is there? I thought this was all eight year olds on TikTok, but apparently it's not. Yeah, I, uh, I, it was Peter uh, over, over Zet, I think, posted that, right? He was like, uh, this is inspiration that I'm not working hard enough on TikTok. I saw that. A few yeah. people sent that to me. I don't, okay, so the way I, the way I look at it is like, there's not one right platform. There's a right platform for you. Like people who don't have a following are the ones that need to be really open to the new platforms because there are going to be land grabs, right? Mm-hmm. You're just starting. You can't expect to build an audience via podcasting or via blogging or even like via Twitter. And it's, you're seeing it, bro. There are so many channels popping up on YouTube. So it's going to be harder and harder and harder to do that. I think YouTube, I think YouTube needs to be, like the core, the staple Uh of, of the content that you're putting out right now. Um, especially in a time where we're seeing brands start to differentiate themselves in fantasy football. Um, YouTube is really, really, really strong in terms of a branding play. And that's the only thing that's going to start separating all the fucking rotos from each other, you know, like actually having that connection with your audience. So YouTube, I think, I don't think YouTube's a fad. I think YouTube needs to be like the front and staple center of every fantasy platforms, uh, you know, base of their content. Uh, TikTok is, yeah, is phenomenal because you can see a kid who's not putting out great content have 500,000 fucking followers based around fantasy football. Like that's the type of leverage this platform has. And like, we don't put out a lot of content on TikTok, but it's because I'm so focused on YouTube, right? I have a a little bit of leverage on YouTube where if I focus all of my energy on that, we're going to see a lot of returns in the meantime. But again, these are things that I'm thinking about like all the time. Like where is our energy best spent? Where are we going to see the best ROI? Should we start investing energy over here and over here, because in two years, that's where we're going to want to be. Um, so I think YouTube needs to be front and center. I think TikTok is phenomenal if you don't have an audience, because you need to go to places where, where it's possible to build a fucking audience. So it's great that you're starting a podcast, but like, don't expect organic growth and don't expect it quickly whatsoever. And you, you really can't, expect, it's not a good business model to go into TikTok expecting to have 50,000 <laughs> followers within a month or two, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's possible. That's, that's the thing. And it's not really possible to do that on a lot of other platforms. So TikTok, yeah, YouTube's great. I mean, you could do it on, on, on Twitch. You could do it on a lot of different platforms. You really just have to understand where you're at in your model and, uh, and adjust accordingly. Uh, so obviously right now on like YouTube podcast redraft right now is obviously like the highest getting like the highest click rate. But do you think if like uh, how Ray GQ does like Debbie stuff, his channel has grown immensely the last month. I believe I was looking at his stats. He gained like 450 subs last month, which is very good, obviously. But um, do you feel like redraft is at its peak dynasty and uh, Debbie as well? Like, where do you feel? Do you think that it, they can all get much higher? And where do you feel the peak is kind of like for content consumption? Um, I don't think any of them are at their peak. What I think, what I think Ray is doing is extremely, I mean, 
I'm not going to say smart because that it was just something that he loved doing. And that's why he did it. It wasn't like a business move from his point, but what he'll do, the further you niche down, the deeper connection that you're going to have with your audience, you know, because those guys are only going to go to Ray for Debbie shit. So Debbie, I have no idea what the ceiling for Debbie is. I don't imagine despite like being on Twitter and seeing people talk about it, the actual ceiling for Debbie is not high whatsoever. You know, it will gain popularity over the next couple of years, but it will never get to the point anywhere close to redraft. And that's the same thing for dynasty. But I do think dynasty has a lot of potential, which is why we are trying to, you know, become the middleman for dynasty. Cause I see a lot of, um, a lot of future focused things where we could take our audience and like, we're the ones that are, you know, even if a lot of people don't like dynasty now, if we just keep pushing our audience, whether it's 35,000 or 50,000 or a hundred thousand to dynasty, we're creating an audience for dynasty in a sense. Right. And then we create the entire funnel in the middle of that. So uh, dynasty, I think has a very high ceiling. I think redraft is, I don't think redraft is anywhere near capped, especially on a, on a platform like YouTube. I just don't think a lot of people know that like YouTube content exists. And if it does, most of them are hesitant to watch it because they just seem, they probably think the same way a lot of people think about TikTok, right? It's like gimmicky. It's probably shitty, shitty quality content. And when they go over there, maybe they do see shitty quality content, but maybe they stumble upon one of our channels or they stumble upon, you know, someone else who does it well. And they're like, oh shit, there is like valuable resources on YouTube. So I think like a very, very, very large portion of redraft people don't even know that content exists on YouTube. So for the ceiling, um, I don't think we're anywhere near it. I think the shit is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow, but there are more people hopping into it, which means it's harder to grow, you know? Yeah, I get that. So obviously, uh, before you've called yourself Nikki Clickbaits, I like to think of this as myself as Nikki Clickbaits Jr. or something like that, because I just put the ESPN logo on all my thumbnails. Now, how do you try to, uh, when you're building like a thumbnail, how do you try to get it so that it makes people want to click it? Because obviously, I mean, if you, these people aren't interested in it, you can just skip ahead. But this is something important. If you make YouTube videos, how do you make the thumbnails? Or are you not even the one making the thumbnails anymore? No, I make all the thumbnails. Um, I... I look at what I, I do a combination. I would also put in uh, for the inspiration question. I forgot to mention them, but the, the channel fantasy football advice with, uh, with Nick and Darian, they uh-huh. are, they do YouTube really fucking well. Like they, they are the real clickbait, clickbait Kings. I said clickbait, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how much clip they're getting in real life, but clickbait, they are the Kings over there. They are really good at thumbnails. They are really good at titles and they're really good at SEO altogether. So what I'll do is I will look at different channels, whether I think their content is good or not, but I'll look at what videos are really popular, right? I'll, I'll go look at fantasy football advice. I'll go look at fantasy footballers. I'll go look at, you know, anyone who, you know, the headliners, whoever does really big numbers on YouTube, I'll be like, okay, what, what titles are working really well for them? What thumbnails are working really well for them? And then I'll just go look on YouTube myself, not even fantasy football related, but I'll go around YouTube and I'll browse videos and I'll be like, what stands out to me? And one thing I realized really quickly is that yellow thumbnails really stood out to me, which is why I made the transition over to yellow. Because when you're going through YouTube, I feel like yellow pops, right? And yeah. I think it's the reason why, like, if you're on Twitter, you see, like, uh, the fantasy footballers have their Twitter avi is just like a bright green thing with their face, right? And you always notice their avi when you're scrolling down the feed as opposed to a lot of other people. So I think they do it really well. So it's a combination of seeing what works well and kind of taking inspiration from that, as well as just like your own personal feel, like what, what actually works, what catches your eye and then integrating that into, into how you make it. Yeah, no, I completely agree with what you said about fantasy football advice. I interviewed Nick like a week ago and that was very good learning about what what he had to say. Yeah, I did. But uh, yeah, my thumbnails kind of look a lot like yours, except for they're not yellow, they're blue, but you know, that's just what I draw the inspiration from. I see all these other people like, uh, uh, F- fancy football advice like we just talked about they used to do their mock drafts with like the sleeper background and that's what I do mm-hmm. now and I put the two players there uh, Lucas actually showed me how to get the background off of like the guy like so you don't have like the field vine you yeah. just drop the guy out like what you guys remove have. remove.bg yeah shout out remove.bg yeah, yeah I, s- I sent Luke that yeah no free ads though so obviously looking yeah. towards the <laughs> towards the future uh, what do you feel like the biggest move is for you towards the future if you can think off your head um, just keeping my fucking sanity, to be honest with you, like <laughs> for real though, the sky is the limit for what we're doing, but I understand to get there. It's the same thing we've been doing to get here. It's shitload of work all the time, consistently day in and day out. So just keeping your mental in check to make sure that other shit stays in line is, is really what it's going to come down to. And yes, I mean, there will always be like innovation, but I don't think anything happens without 
having the motivation to do this shit day in and day out. Yeah. So how, how do you really deal with that? Like burnout? Because like by, by the end of the season, I make content uh, all the way up to week 17. I know you don't do week 17. I probably shouldn't either. But by the time I'm like t- talking about that, I, if you've ever seen that video, that Steelers fan after the Jaguars, or the Jaguars beat them in the playoffs. And he's like, I'm going to go hang myself from the fucking ceiling. You don't want to talk to me. <laughs> You yeah, don't want to yeah, do nothing. That guy, yeah, that's what I feel like week 17. Like, I don't even watch the games. I just make content about it. So yeah. what do you, how do you deal with, like, that burnout? I know you went on vacation this year, but how is that, like, going to – are you going to have to do that every year, or how do you, like, pace yourself? To no, that's, a that's, not a, that's not a long-term plan for that. That's, that was putting a <laughs> Band-Aid on a fucking sinking ship pretty much. So um, it, it's – I think it comes down to being, like, really fucking self-aware about what it is that's making you burn out. I think uh, it goes back to something I said earlier, I think, in the interview about – figuring out what type of content it is that makes me happy and I enjoy making because if I feel like I'm secluded to making that content only during a certain time of the year, then during the times of the year when I'm not doing that, that's when I'm going to get burnt out. I think you could burn out because you're either doing something that you're not passionate about or you're trying to scale too quickly. And I think the latter is probably what a lot of us end up feeling what the burnout is. And now like this in season, I'm definitely going to be pulling back on the, the quality of content or the, the quantity, quantity of content, excuse me. Yeah, definitely, definitely not trying to pull back on the quality. Quantity, <laughs> I'll pull back. One of those ways I could do that is one, by like outsourcing that one video to, to Noah and Mike, right? They take out a video, but we still get a video up on the channel. And just figuring out a schedule because in the season, the time is so fucking important. Like you don't have time to, to relax because you need to get out three or four videos a week about stuff that just happened and then it's going to become irrelevant in two days. So it's, it's really about stepping back and being like, what, what is it that's fucking me up and making me burnt out? Is it like, you know, I can't do four videos anymore. I need to do two for my own sanity. The quality will be higher. You're not going to lose like, okay, like fuck the clickbait, like long-term, you got to look at this shit long-term. You really, you really, really do. It goes back to keeping your shit sane, keeping your mentality good because over the long span, over the long span, you can't just keep putting band-aids on these fucking long-term problems. So um, it's really, yeah, it comes down to just understanding what it is that's the core of the problem and then fixing it that way. Okay, yeah, because during the season, I was making like 13 plus videos a week, like while yeah, going like, to school. Don't, so don't I was that. like, nah, <laughs> no, but like, I, I need to grow, you know, got to get bigger. But obviously, uh, what, what kind of stuff do you feel like you, because obviously from the beginning, you've changed a lot like of your videos. So like I noticed back in the day, you used to create videos. It'd be like team outlook of the giants. And it's like a whole fucking long ass video. It's a movie. You can go watch it. And then now you don't do that type of stuff. So how did you, what made you want to like cut some videos out and bring new ones in? Or is it kind of just a natural type of thing? Uh, a lot of it had to do with what we were just talking about in terms of like deciding thumbnails. A lot of that has to do with the content. I think like, what, what I think is important on YouTube, especially is doing, just do whatever content you want to do, whether it's the team outlook or whatever it is, but understand that the only way you're going to get people to the content is the thumbnails and the titles. So if you can make content about what you're enjoying, but make it relevant to things that are popular within the thumbnails and the titles. So like must own running backs or whatever, like you can, you could, talk about things that are not like directly just a list of must own running backs. You know what I mean? And that's not what yeah. I do, but you can do that. So take the, take the content that you enjoy and intertwine that with things that are relevant in the thumbnail and the title so that you're still bringing people in. But as long as the quality, as long as the content is quality, they're not going to be like, Oh, I'm clicking out because you didn't do a list of fucking must own running backs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's still going to work fine. Yeah. Now, how do you feel like when you obviously right now we're in fucking May, so the videos aren't doing as well. So how do you feel when you like release like a mock draft video that takes really only like an hour, just you sitting there and then you do some other video, take you six hours and it gets like the same amount of views. Do you feel like that annoys you? Cause kind of does to me. Cause like the mocks get way more views than everything else. And they take the least amount of effort, which I just find to be funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting part of the fantasy audience is that they love mock drafts, man. They really do. And, um, I don't know. I just, I just do the best work I can. And, and, and it goes back to just building the foundation, man. Like it, people are going to appreciate the quality of content. Maybe it's not the uh, number that you would like to see that are appreciating the quality of content, but the people that do, those are going to be like really hardcore fans of the shit that you're putting out. So uh, I don't, I don't necessarily get discouraged by it. I just, I, I try to flip it and look at it from a positive light and say like, okay, well the people that did watch it really fucking enjoyed this video probably, yeah. hopefully. 
Yeah. Now, do you look very deep into like the analytics of YouTube, like your watch time and all that, or do you just not even worry about it at this point? No, I, I never did. Uh, <laughs> I don't imagine I ever will. <laughs> uh, and it's probably a, a, a bad thing. Um, definitely to a fault. I just, it just comes back to like, I know I'm doing the best that I possibly can. So yeah. I'm not about to start like looking at that shit for like gimmicks, you know, be like, Oh, they start dropping off at the 24 minute mark. Let me start doing like a giveaway at the 23 minute. Like, I don't know. I just like, I, I don't care about that shit. It's all not long-term shit. I'll just keep doing the best work I can, the most research I can putting out the best video quality I can. And, um, and if that doesn't resonate with you, there's nothing I fucking can do that will. Yeah, no, I, I just find it funny how like some people, they look so deep into it. Obviously, if you don't know it, you obviously know, but the, the listener might not know. At 10 minutes, that's when you can get put an ad like in the middle of your video. So it's funny when you see like these fantasy guys, their video is like 10 minutes and one second because clearly they were sitting there staring at the clock like, holy shit, I need to get this <laughs> ad in here. And I just find that funny because I look that's, at the analytics. To be honest with you, I didn't even know that. I had no you fucking idea. That. That How did you thing. not know that? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like these are the things I just don't care about. Like, I don't know. Yeah, well, you also don't drop like a seven-minute video, so you're fine. Well, yeah, also true. I just like if the ads are on, I just know they're somewhere in the fucking video, but I have no like the logistics behind a lot of things. I just don't, I don't care about. I don't know. Oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I I just like watch like a million YouTube videos on how to do it, so I just learned that stuff uh, over time. So now, uh, one final question here before we get into the lightning round part. So obviously, we kind of talked about uh, what your next big move is, but where do you see yourself like a year from now? Maybe like how you feel. Maybe you're feeling like way better because you didn't burn yourself out, or and, and like numbers wise as well. Like where do you feel your YouTube channel will be at? Because uh, Nick Zylak, when I was talking to him, Nick FFA, he said that. He thought he could hit 100,000 subscribers, and I was like, that's definitely possible. So how do you feel about, uh, about that? Uh, they definitely should. I mean, they're at, like, what? I think they grew, like, almost 50 fucking last summer, so they should yeah. easily hit 100K. Um, so congrats, pre-congratulations to them already. They do a great fucking job over there. Yeah. Um, where do I see myself in a year? I, I don't know. I don't really get, like I, – I don't, I don't do, like, yearly goals, really. I kind of just, mm -hmm. like – I always think like long-term, like something that maybe I want to accomplish in like three to five years and just hope okay. things are going like in that direction in a sense. I mean, I, I think it'd be cool to hit 50,000. I think that's like a cool number to hit. I, I feel like I should be able to hit that. I think it's yeah. a pretty realistic projection. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I don't really think about like one year at a time. I try to just, again, you know, do really good work and, and hope that, you know, the numbers kind of follow along that way. So it should be a really good year for business as, as long as fucking uh, the NFL season actually happens. It should be a good year for um, engagement and everything. But like, again, I'm not, I'm not anywhere near as calculated as, as most people are with this stuff. I just, I, I do everything from like a feel, like a gut and instinct kind of thing. Okay, that makes sense. So now we're going to get into the lightning round portion of the interview. Obviously, you don't have to answer this in three seconds. You can take 10 minutes to talk about something. But the, the first question is, who's the last person that you, you fired? Uh, great question. Um, I would say I, I, I gave Animal a, a not fired. He did something really good the other night, so I didn't fire him. I think I might have fired Scott recently man i just fire all them so often i forget you know it's fucked up like the first time i actually need to fire someone they're never gonna believe me <laughs> that's true it's gonna be a problem i yeah i would say uh i'm just gonna throw it out there and and, and say snacks probably okay that makes a lot of sense snacks so seems like the kind of guy who'd get fired a lot so in fantasy football we all have time. sleepers like how who's a real person that you feel like is slept on is it zendaya no, she she can't be slept on anymore. She's like so she's so popular. That that's a great question. Um, I actually didn't see this on the show sheet. Someone who slept on in real life. Yeah. Listen, man, I I don't want to plug Gary V again, but <laughs> this dude's impact is unbelievable. Uh, he'll always be slept on, no matter how big he gets. A lot of people that I think are slept on are like, music is such a big part of my life. So I think a lot of artists are, are slept on. Um, I think, I don't know why I'm going through a machine gun Kelly phase. And he is, a, he, he makes, he's like a rock star too, bro. He doesn't just rap. So I think he's yeah. a really underrated, I think he's a really underrated uh, artist. I think, I think Kanye gets such an unfair rap. I know he's been out of his fucking mind for like five years, but like <laughs> yeah. prior to the whole Kim K thing, 
Kanye was an absolute fucking genius madman making some of the greatest music that our generation has ever listened to. So I think yeah. Kanye for as big of uh, as a popular person he's gotten, the hate has gone too far on Kanye. Man, I wish I thought about this because I definitely have way better answers for this. But um, I think uh, I think Shia LaBeouf is super underrated too. I love Shia LaBeouf <laughs> so much. Um, yeah, we'll go with those for now. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, Kanye, obviously, like you said, he went through his, his crazy phase. But just a year ago, I think he dropped two albums. Those were very good, I thought. So he's still... Uh, I, I'll be honest. I haven't really liked his music in like probably about five, <laughs> about five years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I will. But I'll listen to his music, his older music, for like until I die. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Me too. So, uh, who would be your dream sponsor? Obviously, you have a bunch of sponsors right now. So, who would be like the the tip top? Like, I know snacks might want to get sponsored by like 3D Doritos or bring those back. So, what would it be for you? I mean, it'd be cool to get sponsored by like a tech company, like a Samsung or a Sony, just because they give us a lot of free shit and it would save me a shitload of money. <laughs> but I would say I would say something that's more like intertwined in my life that would that would that i could like i think it'd be really fucking cool to be sponsored by a tequila company um i think it'd be cool to like keystone light i know snacks has been trying to get us sponsored which i don't understand what the fuck they're doing like why don't they just sponsor? like all they got to do is send us like 230s and we'll be happy and we'll chug their fucking <laughs> beer on on camera and they get thousands of views for it so keystone light i don't i don't know what the fuck they're doing i would like them to sponsor our stuff and uh monster monster energy has, has kept me alive for like the last seven years the white monsters and they're just like two like rock star they're like yeah fantasy's not really up our our alley but like all these liquids basically anything anything liquid <laughs> i'll take as a sponsor tequila monster keystone whatever fuck me up yeah even the, on the other night i was talking to snacks he was talking about how pissed off he was that keystone white still hasn't gotten back to him <laughs> So. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. They were toying with him, telling him that he, he like actually gets upset, which is the funniest part. He'll like call their customer service line and shit. Yeah, they were like tugging him <laughs> off and they didn't let him uh, finish. So he was really mad he, the other night talking about it. So who, who has better pizza? Obviously, you've lived in Jersey and New York. I mean, it's probably New York, but who has better it's pizza? It's New York. Yeah, it's, it's hands down New York. And that's not biased. Like you said, I've, I lived in Jersey for like 24 years. The, the, the pizza <laughs> is good, but it's nothing like like what they have in New York. It's not even close. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, audience question from Tyler. He says, what is the best place? Where's the best place to get pizza in New York? Um, so admittedly, I haven't tried like all the top places in Manhattan. Like Prince Street Pizza is fantastic, supposedly. Uh, I've had a lot of places in Brooklyn. My favorite place in Brooklyn would have to be L&B, Spooning Garden down in Coney Island, which is where I was actually born. And my mom goes back there all the time to uh, to grab us pizza and stuff from there. So L and B Spony garden, but this place, Lindustry L apostrophe I N D U S T R I E, uh, is also fucking phenomenal. And they were like right around the corner from me in Brooklyn. And I would go there like four times a week. The guys was like, do you like work around here? Or, like live around here. You're in here like all the time. I was like, fuck dude. It's like things you don't want to hear from the person who works at a pizzeria. So Lindustry and L and B Spony garden are my favorite in Brooklyn. Okay, so obviously you do those Marg reviews on Instagram. So where's where's the best one you can get in New York? Because once I turn 21, I'm going to have to go to one of these places and uh, test them out. Oh, man. Uh, so the, the problem with the Marg reviews and the Marg ratings uh, are that the high – I've realized that, like, I do a lot of them drunk, obviously. It just comes <laughs> yeah. with the territory. So the drunker I am, the higher the rating becomes. Uh, and I don't okay. think I'm doing that. Like, I don't I – don't, I think I'm being biased because I'm drunk. I really think they're good at the time, but they're probably not. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't actually know off the top of my head, to be honest with you, but I can make a really good at-home margarita that I think rivals most of the ones in, in New York, to be honest. Okay, so obviously you made your uh, Marg recipe on, uh, on one of those episodes. I think it was Fade the Public. Maybe it was after the uh, award show, uh, and you yeah, spilled it everywhere. It. it was pretty interesting. So <laughs> give me your, your Marg recipe real quick, if you would change anything from then. Um, it more. the Marg recipe is simple. I think the, I think where people fuck up. All right. So it's, it's, it's uh, tequila, it's triple sec and it's lime juice. Do not fucking put orange juice in a margarita, please. <laughs> Ew, who does that? Dude, a lot of places make it with orange juice. And I'm like, take this back, take this back before I give you a 1.1 on my fucking story. You motherfucker. So those are the three ingredients. What, what most people underestimate is they don't put enough ice in. And they need real limes. So it's a ratio. You go two, one, one, tequila, and then the other two. So for every, you put like two shots tequila, one shot triple sec, one shot 
of, uh, of lime juice. And then you take a lime, cut it in half and squeeze the entire thing into it. Whole lot of ice and you're fucking good to go. It's beautiful. Sounds good. I'm going to have to be making that in a couple of weeks. So who also, quick, yeah, who, you could put a fourth ingredient in there too. If you like, if you want to do like a splash of lemonade or a splash of monster or an extra splash of tequila or something, you're good to go. A couple splashes of tequila extra for me. Exactly. Yeah. So who, who would be your, uh, dream dinner guest like if you go to dinner with anyone would it be gary v or would it be someone different it would be it would be gary v uh i would like to pick elon musk's brain too because he's he's crazy just what he's created from the the interesting thing about elon musk is that um like he has created these companies where he is not an expert in the field whatsoever like spacex he's not like a fucking astronaut he's not a a rocket scientist or anything like that (laughs) but he's been able to create these businesses based on this stuff and his passions and interests are so fucking far-fetched and he's such a weird dude that i would like to see how he like you know how he expands those things when he actually doesn't have any knowledge behind them you know Uh that makes a lot of sense so i think i would probably pick el prez i'd love to talk to that guy i would he would be uh he would definitely be in the top five for me Mm mm-hmm all right, so uh, one last question here. Uh, what are you guys going to do? This, honestly, is not even like a lightning round question. What are you going to do this year? Do you think that you can still do the, uh, like, in-person league thing, the New York draft? Do you think you're still going to be able to do that or no? I have no idea. Uh, if I had to put money on it right now, I would probably say it doesn't happen um, because people are coming from all over the place. So to, um, to think that people from, you know, like California or wherever are going to be able to fly out here by August – probably a little bit of a reach. So yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the plans that we had this summer for the in person stuff are going to have to be put on, um, on the back burner. So with that league in particular, though, we're actually just starting a dynasty startup with the guys that are in the league. So in case we don't get the league this year, um, we'll have something a little extra in store for them. But yeah, this might just be a fucking big brand building year, man, just put your head into the fucking computer, put the content out and then as much as it hurts me to say this, like really fucking uh, have some fun with it next summer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that one guy, Lucas, in your league is funny as fuck. He, he was like I yelling at Lucas. the camera. You don't like I'm him? Gonna, I, want, I love that I'm guy. I'm going to kill. No, I love <laughs> Lucas. Here's the thing. Everybody loves him, but none of you motherfuckers are the one that needs to babysit him for a weekend. When you need to keep that guy under control for a weekend, it becomes a whole different fucking game. Oh, my God. He's so fucking funny. He was screaming about David Montgomery last time, about how great he would be, and then about how uh, someone drafted Darwin Thompson in that league in, like, the sixth round. That was an amazing video. Yeah, Lucas's team ended up going, like, 1-12 in 12 that year. Um, it, he was horrible. He was so bad. His draft was terrible, and he was going nuts about it. And then I don't even want to talk about, like, at night, the shit that I had to fucking deal with with him. So, yes, there is uh, – I love Lucas, but – um lucas buddy you're not you're not 20 fucking three years old anymore all right here real last question here how did you get when did you determine that you wanted to record the e-town get down draft like obviously that the uh video started like four or five years ago maybe recording that so what made you want to bring the camera there and do like the confession cam type of thing like what what was the idea behind that i don't know to be honest i just think (laughs) i i thought it would be fun um But when the confession cam idea popped into my head, I was like, this is fucking, that was like one of the ideas that I had that I thought was fucking brilliant. Right. I don't, I don't think (laughs) I think of a lot of like cool things or like brilliant ideas, but I was like, yo, this could be funny. I just imagine like, I think this was probably when like the Jersey shore was really popular. And I was like, dude, the confession cams that they do when they come home drunk are like the funniest fucking things on television. So why don't we just do that at our fantasy drafts? Um, I don't know why we decided I'd imagine I think I started my YouTube channel before then and I was like this could be a cool video if we did this right and people want to see like a real draft going on I didn't realize that it would be like that popular that people would like love it that much but it was an easy way for me to intertwine like my passion for the lifestyle and vlogging kind of thing with fantasy football so I was like yeah that works and then the confession cam was just like a funny thing that um, turned out to be a, a lucky great idea. Yeah, those those vlogs are amazing. It was funny this year when uh, Stevie drafted Josh Jacobs, and it seemed like he had no idea who Josh Jacobs was when he picked him. That was the best part. Yeah, that's it's it's so funny. Like Stevie, Steve is probably uh, Steve is probably the funniest person that I know. Like in real life, he's he's like one of the funniest people I've ever met. And yeah. he he won this year, obviously. But sometimes <laughs> I feel like he has no fucking idea about football whatsoever. Like the fact that he came in there and he was like Josh Jacobs, and he was like <laughs> it's not even his fucking name, you asshole. But he ends up like winning the league, so. 
Um, that's that's what makes fantasy great, man. That's what that's also why I don't necessarily like get down on myself for getting shit wrong because they're yeah. like I could get everything right and there are still gonna be people that call him Josh Jankups and win their fantasy league. You know what I mean? It's all about it's 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 still at the end of the day, redraft is about having fun and like making it engaging for people. Yeah, no, I definitely get that. So thank you obviously for coming on here. Uh, it really does mean a lot. So you can plug anything you want here and then we can go our ways. No, it's all good. Um, I I, uh, I had a pleasure. I mean, the time just fucking flew by. To be honest with you, it was it was a fun conversation. Again, it was it was fun to be on this side of things to kind of get to open up and hopefully have your audience and and my audience. I'm gonna put this on my YouTube channel as well. Um, you know, get to know me a little bit more. And I think that's really what all this content creation is about is is being able to you know, relate to people and, and have them feel maybe a little less, I don't want to make it sound depressing, but a little less alone. I think that's what we're here to do. That's like a job yeah. of ours, right? So we show, we share who we are, we're vulnerable and other people can relate to it. So it was fun to have a conversation like this. Um, yeah, my YouTube channel is just my name, Nick Ercolano. So you could find me there. Um, and then same thing, make sure you go subscribe to, to Nick's channel for those of y'all that are watching on my YouTube. Uh, so Nick, yeah, thank you for having me, man. It was a pleasure. All right, yeah, thank you guys very much. If you guys uh, want to check Nick out, like I said, everything's down below in the description. If you're watching on Nick's channel, please uh, just check it out. You don't even have to subscribe. Just watch like one of my videos. I'm sure it's not that bad. So thank you guys all for watching. I love you all. Have a great rest of your day.